You can now follow me on all my social media platforms to find out who my latest guest will be. And don't forget to click the subscribe button and the notifications bell so you're notified for when my next podcast goes live. And boom, we're on. And today's guest, we've got Lord Miles. Lord, how are we? Good to meet you, man. Good to I'm see you, bro. Fan. It's oh. good to have you on. Oh, yeah, I'm fan a little yeah, bit, man. Yeah, good, mate. Oh, good stuff. Mad stories. You were all from Kabul there. Always, um, man. In prison, captured. But it's very interesting, mate. Obviously, a lot of your online stuff. I've just seen you done a podcast with Tate as well. Massive things. First yes, and man. foremost, how are you? I'm solid, man. I had a lovely holiday. Eight months in Taliban prison. I actually kind of enjoyed it. A little bit nostalgic for it. Um... I, I, it was the best networking event I ever had, mate. How are you doing, by yeah, the way? Do you know what? I'm really good, mate. Life is going amazing. Feeling good. Family life. Podcasts are flying. Yeah. So all in all, life is good. You're looking solid, mate. Absolutely. Thank you. If you want a hard income, I can organise yeah, it. Yeah, set, set it up, bro, mate. If it brings views, I'm all, I'm, I'm there. Oh, absolutely, yes. It definitely will bring views. Yeah, good. Yeah. Before I get into everything, I always like to go back to the start of my guests. Get a bit of understanding about you, who you are, what you're all about, where you grew up, how course, it all began. Mate. Of course, so it all began in a very dark place in the world. It's called Birmingham. Now, Birmingham is like the Detroit of America. It's a very dark, dodgy place, mate. And to be fair, it's uh, it's full of uh, it's full of very interesting people who uh, would love to have your phone or your wallet. So every once in a while, I would go in some dangerous situations in Birmingham as a kid. And at one point, I was homeless on the streets of Birmingham at 17 for a few months before my A-levels, you know, before my qualification, before uni. And that was a tough time in my life. Before then, I was like very, very nervous about life, very risk averse. And I think that had a profound impact on me. Because after that, I became a little bit riskier, realizing, hey, I thought I was going to become homeless for life or a very short life in the streets of Birmingham. I think I should live it up a little bit. And when I got to 2021, I was studying a physics degree at Loughborough University. From there, I became famous by becoming the last ever tourist at the fall of Kabul. Now, I didn't go to Afghanistan knowing that the whole thing would collapse. I booked it many, many months in advance because I didn't want the COVID vaccine. And it was the only country at the time that would accept anyone who goes in with a tourism visa. So I went in and then three days later, Taliban took over and I was vlogging it and I was posting about it on 4chan. Once again, kind of a lovely holiday. I met the Taliban, met SAS soldiers. Just kind of goofed off a little bit. Mm -hmm. Some mad stuff. Of course, yeah. What were you like at school? At school, at school, I had, I had hair. I had hair. So that was a lovely time. Same, mate. Yeah. Oh, I'll go to Turkey at some point. <laughs> <laughs> but at school, I was, I was very uh, teacher's pet type of kid. You know, I would, I would always do my homework, always go the extra mile. I was trying to go into art, bizarrely. Like I was really good drawer, a uh, really good actor. Uh, but I was also good at science, kind of. So that was my thing. Um, I I think I did some good stuff. Had a few friends, but wasn't like super popular. Wasn't uh, an outcast or just in the middle. I think it was it was a solid time, but I don't really miss it. What know? about family? Ah, dodgy family life, man. I've got to admit, and I'm completely open about this. No problems. Mm -hmm. So I don't have a father. It was through IVF, and they signed something saying, "Hey." Uh, don't tell us, uh, you know, um, don't tell the kid the details. So I tried to go to the agency that, you know, took the sample uh, of my father's DNA to have me. And uh, sadly, obviously wants nothing to do with me. So I lived with my mother, single family, living on benefits. So everyone thinks I'm some sort of rich kid traveling. Well, hell no. Own business, self-made, thankfully. But uh, she was on benefits. And I think at like 11 years old, we would actually dump to die for food. Because it was around, it was just, uh, it was just after financial crisis. Our benefits got reduced like five, five pounds a month. No joke, because he thought she was committing benefit fraud or something. So we would go to a supermarket called Iceland, and we would just jump the fence. We would climb inside the bins, and there'll be some freshly thrown out food, like frozen food that was expired, like expired one day ago. And we would eat that stuff. It was, it was a dark time, man. And she had a lot of mental health problems. A bit of an alcoholic too. Uh, major depressive disorder, um, narcissistic personality disorder, bad times. Um, so there was some dodgy stuff going on with her. Uh, really couldn't stay in the house, heads for homelessness. And then uh, to be fair, when I turned 18, I was like, I'm not seeing any improvement, mate. It's, it's, going, it's getting worse and worse and worse. I need to separate myself from that. 
you know, for my own safety at some point too. Like I almost got stabbed by my own mother. And so uh, I left home to go to uni. Didn't tell I got into uni. I just, just left, cut contact. And then I sent a letter saying, hey, if you improve, if you, you know, cut out the alcohol over time, if I see some improvement, we could build something up. Never happened. How hard is that when you see your mother slipping, there's nothing you can really do. You try and tell her, listen, please change, please change. Because you know yourself, if people need to change, it's all down to the individual. Yes, mate, of course. I've struggled myself. I know countless other people who struggle. In fact, everybody struggles. Yeah, I don't give a fuck what anybody says. Everybody deals with their different traumas, different levels. But how hard is that to see a mother when you're rummage, rummaging through bins to then sleeping mm. on the street to then seeing there's no change but only mm. thing you can do is walk away yeah. for your own mental sanity i got i gotta be honest at 11 years old this is what happened so uh it's it was before some exams or something and this is when i realized that it's so over you know it's not happening 11 years old i was lying in my bed and it was before a day it was like a few hours before exams middle of the night and i hear her shouting my name you know slurred miles 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 and I actually got some footage of this just to prove I'm on the right of this because you know, she was a little crazy. She had put loads of stuff on the stairs, just random objects, and purposely tripped herself down the stairs or thrown herself down the stairs. So over three hours, I just thought she was drunkenly called my name. Turns out she fell down the stairs, cracked her head open, blood everywhere, big pool of it. And I'm 11 years old, that didn't freak me out. That was normal. That was like a monthly or even weekly occurrence, this type of stuff. You know, it's crazy. So I go to her, I pick her up, I, I, uh, she's like half naked, it's bizarre. And I call for an ambulance and the police and the uh, fire department all that know our house by this point, like we've got a reputation. And then as soon as I call the police, she suddenly stops the act, she gets up and just goes to bed and just refuses an ambulance. So it was all an attention act, it was really, really bizarre. And 11 years old, even at that point as a kid, I just sat there, you know, stroking my chin and went... Yeah, this is just not normal. This is not going to be a proper relationship. This is going to go downhill. So I accepted it very early on. You know, I very, I got I got matured, bizarrely, uh, very fast, you know. Mm -hmm. And uh, I got a job at, I think it was 13, 14 years old, officially 14, you know what I mean? Uh, two days a week, uh, you know, part-time job, solid 16 hours a week. And I would just pay for my food and look after myself. And I think it's like, I kind of think it's made me like this in some ways. Because... If I had loved ones, if I had a family where they cared for me and loved me and all that, I don't think I would do what I do because it's too risky putting through them through stuff. But seeing them not improving, not really my family. Yeah, I have no family. Do you think you grew up fast then having to figure it out from yourself from a very young age? Oh, absolutely, yeah. So people at school would be talking about you know the most boring stuff and I would be thinking... <clears throat> holy shit, with my finances, will they stretch next week? How do I do this? Or how do I prepare for my credit score? You know, like 14 and stuff. Um, it really does mature your stuff. And a lot of people can't relate as a kid. So you're kind of stuck in that bubble where you can't talk to anyone about it because kids are judgmental, you know what I mean? So you kind of have to uh, be mature and kind of hide it at the same time. Yeah, back then, like I say, it's not you're ashamed, but... You just, you just even know, because I had a guy on, oh, amazing man. His, his mum was a, the Britain's the most evilest mum. He used to eat rat droppings in his sister's sick and stuff. She tied him behind the car and drove around with him. He oh, still shit. loved her. He still yeah. fucking loved her. It's always going to be a small part and of And I thought, know? fuck me, there's part of element where it's, I can understand where you don't want to speak out. You don't want to get your mum in trouble and stuff like that. What did you do after school? After school, I, uh, so... When I was homeless and... Oh, you mean like after uni? Or? No, just when you left school at 15, yeah, 16, so you ended yeah. up homeless. I, left, I went to sixth form, to be fair. But um, at 17 and a half, I became homeless for three months. So this is this is my mum's mindset. It's very bizarre, mate. Uh, she literally thought, ah, oh, Miles is going to leave for university. And, uh, you know, because he's living in the house, our mortgage is going to be taken away from us because he's technically a kid or a dependent or a student or something. So if I make him homeless... He will, be, and she made this while strong, by the way, so I 100% believe it. She said, you know, if we, if I make him fail his entry exams, his A-levels, he will be forced to stay at home. And then obviously she'll be able to click some dough off it. And obviously I was paying her occasionally through my job, you know, and that's illegal as well. But I was paying her, you know, just some stuff. Uh, so she keep, can keep afloat herself. 
And I thought to myself, that's like the scummiest thing you could do. So obviously just left. Uh, went to university, went to Loughborough University, studied physics of all things. So, uh, you know, I really hated myself there. <laughs> um, just studied and COVID happens. So I was like, this trash. Worked, uh, worked a full-time job while studying. What did you do? I worked at this phone store called Free. Uh, that was fun. I'm with the bastards, I know, mate. Sorry to hear that. Your signal, signal's crap, mate. Why is the signal so shit? Yeah, I don't know. Uh, they're cheap bastards, aren't they? You know, uh, oh. by the Chinese, like all telecommunications. Uh, yeah, I would, I would honestly go to another network, mate. Um, but I worked with them. It was fucking insane because you would meet some chavvy as hell people with some crazy stories. Uh, sometimes you would have people that had uh, gone to fight to run into the store and then hope they were hoping that the other person who was fighting them wouldn't run in because they would point to the camera so every once in a while we'd have some guy bloodied up run into the store just hiding underneath a chair i was like all right mate it's normal mm -hmm. stuff and you would always have some crazy people so i was just doing that for about three years just working part-time uh, i was doing some other stuff too as so i got into like banking and whatever i wanted to go down the pipeline of a normal job yeah so that's mm -hmm. pretty surprising um I wanted to go to investment banking or, you know, investment wanking. I was mm -hmm. fucking wankers. Yeah, they, <laughs> they're not the best of the world, are they? But it makes money. So I thought, you know, I'm going to go down that route. So I'm just obsessed with money at this point. Because like, as a kid, I've never had money. So that was just my priority at that point. Mm -hmm. So a kid then, university went through it, kind of homelessness, kid working university. Was life okay then? Yeah, it was solid to be fair. I got a scholarship and I got a bursary because it's like, hey, you're poor as hell here's some free money. So I was like, oh, thanks government. Good stuff. Mm. Um, so I was just chilling, had some good flatmates and I became famous at university for unrelated reasons. So uh, people in the UK that have been to university recently uh, all know that on Facebook or Instagram, you got these confession pages where you can send in anonymous confessions about, you know, students and you can say like, uh, it wouldn't be the student's name, it would be their initials, like A from uh, a from geography fancies B from physics, but B is cheating on someone with C. You know, just gossip stuff. I ran one of those pages and I was public about it. So I was like a big name in Loughborough University for a few years. And it was like I was walking down and everyone would just talk to me. I, it was like a little bit of fame. And at that point, I was like, you know what? This is the height of my fame. I'm never going to do anything public. Uh, I'm never going to blow up. You know, it's just this is a nice little snippet of things. I'm going to work a nice, normal uh, job. And that's going to be the end of it, man. What did you do after the university? Oh, I uh, I accidentally popped down to a fall of Kabul and became famous. And then I was like, yeah, screw the uh, screw the university pipeline. I'm just I'm just traveling for a living. It pays better, man. So you gave it all up? Yes, mate. Because <gasps> I thought about it. I got a sixty-eight thousand pound offer from this one bank in Shanghai. They were like, come work for us. And I thought to myself, all right, mate. I'm gonna be working what eight a.m. to ten p.m. six and a half days a week. Uh, so sixty-eight thousand. That type of hours. It's not even solid hourly rate. Then I realized, oh, because it's so competitive, you got to live in the city center. So that's two or three grand every single month in rent just for like a small apartment. And so, I mean, half it's also taken by taxes too because you're on the high tax rate. What's the tax over there, 40? Oh yeah, like 40, 45, same with same us. Same as everywhere yeah, then. It's, it's crap basically. It's so uh, shite, so, shite here. Man. Yeah, so I realized, oh crap, I'm going to be earning no money because of the the uh the cost of living relative to the actual uh income sucks i then i spoke then i started digging i found stories about like my managing director at the time he was earning what two hundred fifty thousand pounds a year and plus bonus and every single month he would only have 400 pounds left in his bank account because expenses are that high you know mm -hmm. yeah it's fucking pointless man. yeah screw that i would just rather goof <clears throat> off and um go sell tally yeah. <laughs> it, it obviously earns so good money but you've got so then you've got nothing you've then created a life for yourself where you can have something yeah, exactly were you not scared though that what if you ended up homeless again by giving it all up uh, you know at one point i i was thinking about that i was thinking i could really go south technically i'm homeless now mate because i cancelled my uh rent after the fall of the ball so uh you know, before <coughs> during the uh sorry during my imprisonment i uh cancelled my rent just thinking it might be long term but so i'm living in hotels right now but money's no problem so we're good so technically homeless <laughs> <laughs> but um i was worried about it. i thought i might be screwed over i might do something stupid i might you know lose all my money and bugger knows where but i had people dming me saying hey miles if you want to work for an investment bank my boss actually really likes what you do regardless of the controversy we got off you a sick salary in germany or whatever and i was like wait a minute an international incident this is bringing more opportunity than 
the detriment of you know what what actually I'm going through. Crap, this is actually a great networking opportunity. So mm. I was like, I've always got a backup plan. I've got backup plan A, B, C, D, E, all the way to Z, mate. That's the best way, mate. Yeah, like man. I say, it's yeah. mad. And even negative attention, positive attention, it opens doors. Yeah, you absolutely know that yourself. Yeah. You've, you've done some good work. You've climbed. Yeah. And no matter, everything's to create noise. But doing it in a, oh, a way where it's, you're not being fake, false, yeah. where... Yeah, it's people just think ah, side up half. Yeah, yeah, do you know what I mean? Best. Just be you and let yeah. other people do the talking. Yeah, that's, of course. that's my job. My job is fucking easy. The traveling's hard. People don't really see behind the scenes. And you know, the boring yeah. admin stuff. You're doing invoices and it's, yeah. So the behind the scenes is more. I love I love speaking to people. That's what I shine. I can see that, man. You're good at this. Thank so you. I've been through a lot of interviews. A ton of people. You know, even Feds interviewed me, but. You're one of those people that actually do listen mm -hmm. and you seem solid with this type of stuff. And you got a cheesy smile, mate. <laughs> <laughs> See, so then you've gave everything up. What was the plans then? Why how did you end up in all the places you was that a vision yeah. that you had, or is it just kind of day by day it fell into fruition? Yeah, so I had a, a decent chunk of change in university. I through a banking stuff, I had like a chunk of change and I had some money invested and it was I got into AMD really early and set some crypto too. So I thought I got like a nice little cushion just in case. So I planned it out. And I looked at the YouTube space. And I saw there were so many travel vloggers, so many YouTubers like that, who, you know, go to Afghanistan, go to Iran, Iraq, all these countries we think is dodgy. And they gain no views. You know, they've got no personality. So I'm like, oh, you have to be a personality yourself. It doesn't matter about the destination. You really have to stand out. You have to be boisterous, you know. So I thought to myself, I'm going to use the media right here. So the media were writing trash about me. And I approached loads of these journalists and I said, hey, hello, journalists, you know, Shalom. Uh, you, you kind of, you know, we're not best mates here. You know, you obviously don't like me, but have I give you the stories exclusively? You pay me a little chunk of change, a few hundred here and there, you know, and you can write absolute trash about me, but we'll orchestrate it together. So we kind of set the narrative so everyone gets hate clicks. And that kind of happened. So I kind of always got clicks, which funneled into my Twitter, funneled into my YouTube. And then I would do donations and stuff. So people started donating to me. I said, hey, this, I'm going to need some donations for like half a year to I pick up and so find, uh, basically throw, excuse my language, throw shit for and see what sticks. Mm -hmm. So I went to some different countries and I thought the media would be my biggest source of income. No, it turns out buying up random merchandise from military groups and stuff and reselling it at a markup. That was sick money. So, uh, you know, South Sudanese military sold South Sudan patches. No one else could get them anywhere. I just, you know, paid cash in hands under the books for those people. And then just flew them back in my carry-on. Decent money. How much did they sell for? Uh, so I could buy a patch for $1 a piece, my maximum. Like, I was paying a premium too because of white dude. So and I sell them for $40. But it was the, it wasn't... You know, it was cheap to buy it. It was, I actually went to these countries, sourced them out where no one else actually managed to do it previously and then resold them a markup because no one else is willing to go there and no one else knows where to buy them. So the collectors that are trying to go for worldwide patches or new countries in general, they they see, oh crap, you're actually risk your life in one of these countries. The markup's worth it and that's pretty solid. What were they? Just military patches from their government, just like uh, special from soldiers. Forces. Yeah, that type of stuff. Because nothing gets out of South Sudan, man, without uh, either a million permits or you know, a little cash in hand. So you know how Africa works. Yeah. yeah, yeah. What was the first place you went to? So Fall of Kabul. That was my first official place. That was public, so that blew me up. And, and this was three years ago? Yeah, three years ago, man. Uh, August of 21. Did you know the military was going to leave? No, mate. I was told by the embassy. I, I think there's people still there. I think there's soldiers still there. Oh, yeah, still in prison. Oh, well, yeah. yeah. Yeah, it's already been kept down low because all the governments don't want it to be public because that'll put pressure on them to actually act. You see what I mean? Mm -hmm. It's it's very bad. So, what, what that, Kabul was the first place you went? Yes. And absolutely. all the military and stuff was there? Did, did, yeah. Did we, see, when you went there, was everybody yeah, was I had, still run by yeah. the army? Yeah, so I had. I had some NATO soldiers, uh, you know, family, friends or whatever saying, uh, yeah, this is solid. There's no problems. Kabul is going to be holding. We're going to take over back. We're going to take over Afghanistan again. You have a Taliban on. I'm going to take over. Trust the plan. Yeah, don't trust the plan ever. Uh, journalists, uh, I believe the journalists, you know, that was that was interesting. They said, yeah, it's got to hold out for six months at least. Uh, embassy staff were like, yeah, it's chill, man. You go on holiday, no problem. A little bit ballsy, but we respect that. Um, I went there and then... When I got to Kabul, 
I saw some bulky American dude, some uh, military contractor, I assume, packing up. He's like, what are you doing here, mate? I was like, holiday. And he just, he just looked at me like, this fucking guy. And he said, I'm going to see you soon, most likely. Yeah. And, um, and I got some, I got some bad uh, feelings, and but I rebooked really my flight back, so I thought too late. After that, I went down to South Sudan, did a whole East Africa tour, went to a Hollywood, so a uh, a producer uh, that actually makes Ugandan movies, it's like total shit posts, mate. Really funny ones, really bad animation, but it makes it entertaining. So I starred in one of those as you do mate mm -hmm. uh, I got blown up with really terrible CGI after that do you remember when Russia kind of half invaded Kazakhstan this was way before Ukraine so most people don't remember it I jumped because Kazakhstan became a black zone where no information got in or out and there was no way to get in or out unless if you were a citizen so I jumped a mountain border in the midst of night avoiding Russian mares you know um so I got there after like two days in the mountains, just you know, freezing my tits off. And then suddenly the, uh, the whole military blockade actually opened up. So it, it was like the worst timing whatsoever. But it was an entertaining video. After that, the front lines of Ukraine. I, I had through some friends, some contacts I made, the exact day it would happen and it bloody did, man. So I was there on the ground on the front lines in Kharkiv, uh, just watching it all go down. I was hanging out with some soldiers at the time who thought I might be a Russian fed, but they found out quickly, obviously not. Uh, position was getting pretty much bombarded uh, through uh, through artillery. So we went from eating out of a can, enjoying some lovely t uh, chicken, to let's get to a fucking base when the building right next door just collapsed. You know, uh, glass from the window just pretty much exploding from the uh, pressure of the, of the explosion, slamming me in my face, cuts all the way down my face running down the stairs, running down the stairs, lights going out, complete darkness. We get to the basement, half a building collapses on us, but we had a nice tunnel entrance out of the, uh, out of the you know, basement compound area. Dude, I really enjoyed it, man. That's my type of thing. I had some great footage. I remember the last minute they said, oh, we have to ask you to delete it. Do you think that's because of your upbringing, the kind of fear, the anxiety, you thrive on that adrenaline now? Yeah, no joke. To be fair, at this point, I don't even get adrenaline out of it. It's just like... It's just in my mind, I think, crap, I'm actually doing this stuff. This is a great bloody story. I think it's funny to some degree sometimes. Like a movie? Almost, yeah. Like, uh, it sounds a bit narcissistic, but honestly, yeah. Sometimes you just kind of look at your situation and go, you know what? A few years ago, I was just working a normal nine to five job. And you just kind of chuckle these stuff and go, somehow it's working out, mate. Mm -hmm. Somehow so, it's working out. So Kabul's at the capital of Afghanistan? Yes, mate. So what was it actually like when you get there as a much hatred towards the British or the Americans or how, how is it because obviously we see things in the news and stay back from these people that are evil it's oh you can't trust the news man is this post takeover that you're talking about so yeah just when you, you you first get there did you see anything different was the people nice like how how does it all work because it, like I just says in the news and that it portrays people of being evil the British are the best oh, but the British course. have invaded over 90% of the world so mm. we know those stories and I've no bad uh, I know soldiers I know SA guys and I love them eh, but that was their life at the time they've been chosen to do it they yeah. chose to do that life they're just mm. following orders it's just for government wankers yeah, yeah it's not the men like I say all the wars that's happening and now if all soldiers put down their weapons for me then there's no destruction yeah, no, but the real question for me is it's the people telling them to do these things and mm. you've got Israel and Palestine I'm not qualified to be speaking on them I just find it all messy I think what else is behind it and yeah it's tragic what's happening. Yeah, all, honestly, just yeah. all innocent people and yeah. kids and women. If you're a soldier and a soldier fighting against each other, they've chose that life yes, to right. kill each other. Then by all means, mm, you signed yeah. up for that. I don't, I don't, I've spoke to enough soldiers now to realise it ain't normal to see the struggle in their eyes, the pain in their face too. It's not a human, it's human beings we should be better than that yeah getting on with yeah, we should be, figuring it yeah, out. Yeah, we should be figuring that out. But never will, again, greed and power, brother, it takes you to places that yeah, it's only the devil that knows what's yeah. go going on there. But when you get to Kabul, how was the? How did the people treat you? Are you treated yes, well, or you you outcast? Oh, I'm treated lovely. So my second time in Afghanistan was a few months after the fall of Kabul. Um, so I go there, I go there, and I drive in through Pakistan, through uh, Bashar and Jalalabad, and I get to Kabul. It's night time, and I'm looking for a hotel I knew from the fall of Kabul. 
So I'm looking around and I find this one place and all hotels are pretty much compounds, right? Just for security. Mm -hmm. They were built during the, uh, with a NATO occupation. So I knock on the door and some Taliban guy looks me, uh, lock, uh, brings me in and he says, come in, come in. And I'm like, oh crap, I'm talking to the Taliban. Mm. And I get in and this is my first impression of the Taliban, by the way, so I'm a bit scared to be fair. And I get brought into a room and they're like, what are you doing here? I was like, oh, hotel. And they were looking at me like, this bloody guy, we haven't seen a white dude in ages, but uh, they sit me down and we're like, oh, this used to be a hotel, now it's like a Taliban uh, you know, housing area. So I'm like, crap. So I'm like, what, what's happening now in the Taliban compound? You know, do I get tied up? Do I get questioned? Do I, do I get arrested? Nah, mate, they invited me in. They're watching cricket on this really old TV. They lay down on a mat, they're like, we're going to get some food, maybe we're going to get some chicken, we're going to get some naan, we can have a good time. Um... They're just chilling with me. They're using Google Translate to talk to me. They have a big smile. You know, they've just fought us for 20 years. And they invited me as a guest. Like, hey, come sit down, mate. Come sit down. Don't even vet me. Don't even search my bag or anything. I could be dodgy. I could have been. That's fine. But they, they just, they're very naturally trusting and good people. So they were like, hey, you're a guest in that country. You got a passport and visa. That's all we need. Sit down and enjoy yourself, mate. So I'm, I'm nervously eating, but I start warming up to them. And I'm thinking... Holy crap, they're my tally bros, not my tally foes, you know? Mm -hmm. uh, so I really did enjoy it, man. And that first stay in Kabul was just like that. I'd walk down the streets in local attire, and some Taliban dudes would look at me like, that's a white dude, right? And then they would call me over and they're like, can we take a selfie? I'm like, hell yeah, we'll take a selfie. And we're just chilling. You know those um, trucks, the uh, convoys, SUVs, or whatever, that the Americans left behind, military vehicles? They were like, Climb up here, take a picture if you want, take a selfie on here. I'm like, hell yeah, I want to take a selfie. And I look at other people who did the same stuff a few months after me. Uh, I was the first OG. I'm yeah. But um, I look at some people were just chilling with the Taliban. Some people um, were, were going on their trucks driving with the Taliban. Some people went on picnics with the Taliban. Um, a few after a few trips later, so I've done five trips to Afghanistan total, going to be six in a few months. Um, I went shooting with the Taliban. I just said, hey, uh, can we go out some field somewhere I get to shoot your guns it'll, I think it'll be a fun YouTube video they were like hell yeah brother no problem Mushkinishta. that's what it means in Pashtun Mushkinishta. no problem mm -hmm. and it's just solid mate because was that, that's your most viewed video on YouTube the oh, shooting yes. of the guns with the Taliban yeah I mean sadly yeah I, I wish I did I focus more on YouTube but now we've got everything in place and then obviously the, uh, the uh, my arrest happened so we couldn't officially go through the whole thing, but that's my most viewed. Yeah, just just over one point five million, I think, at the moment. But we're going to be putting out some good documentaries and some solid content in the future. I said that's what it's all about. You're still learning, man. you're still growing, you're still figuring it out. Just of like it's all, we're always trying to figure it out. You understand we'll, it? We'll never have it figured out. Oh dear, when we yeah. Talk about this is a movie. Or you feel as if you're in a movie. This is that, mate. Life is just one big script. We write it. Of course. Where the yeah. fuck do we want to take yeah, it? Things are constantly changing, yeah. so you have to always adapt and yeah. learn and you know, become a better person, man. Yeah, yeah, of course. What's the steps to get into Kibble visas and how do you get into it? Is it a lot of red flags everywhere? There's a lot of red tape. Yeah, to be fair, it's actually pretty simple. Most of the time, if you fly to Europe, you know, you just show your passport stamp you have to get a visa so you, you can't do it online they don't have e-visas you need to pop down to an embassy so if you go to dubai or islamabad uh it's same day uh visa but sometimes you get denied and obviously you don't want to make all the trip halfway you don't want to make the trip halfway and waste your time if you get denied so i went to the us as uh, sorry the um the embassy in london the afghan embassy and they're run by the old government staff but they obviously getting orders from the Taliban and there's some reforms going on, different requirements. So it's kind of a weird situation. So you walk in, they look at you like, oh, hell, why do you want to go to Afghanistan? Fair enough. And they say, you know, you need this paperwork and you go, okay. So they always ask me, they say, we need a reason for your travel, uh, you know, explained on an A4 piece of paper with your signature. So I was like, okay, I know what I'm going to do. So I literally wrote in, in uh, word, fun, and just printed that on an A4 piece of paper, just the word fun, you know, just in tiny font, font, signed it, slid it over, and they just read it, and they were like, this fucking guy, uh, the, you know, the, uh, the audacity just to write that instead of a proper sentence, but they were like, we well, accept it, I guess, um, and then you got to uh, fill out some forms, so if you go for tourism, you got to have a tour guide that you got to pay for, of course, you know, a registered tour agency, and you got to get some stamps and some nonsense like that. For myself, because I run a business, 
you can kind of invite yourself for business. So you can write a letter and you have to kind of, you have to get an invite from your company. But because of course I'm the only one, I'm the director of my own company. I invited myself to Afghanistan to conduct business for myself and to keep myself safe. So through bureaucracy, I have to say I'm looking after myself, like I'm some sort of schizophrenic with multiple personalities. Um, and when me and my friends went to Afghanistan uh, together, uh, we wrote, we had to write out another letter for my friends. So we downloaded a template online. Uh, and when we did that, we didn't change the name of the bottom, we forgot. So apparently Quadrangle Dingle. <laughs> was inviting us to Afghanistan and they just didn't care they were like yeah to be fair you're wearing suits you don't look dodgy you're probably not fed your you kids you know uh, you're the documents Here, take, we need your passport pay like 200 quid uh, within a week we'll send you the passport for the post back I'm like yeah it's a bit of red tape to be fair but it's solid mm -hmm. it's not too bad getting to places like Libya North Korea uh, Eritrea those are the real bitches those are really, really difficult to get visas for. You need you need pool. You need to travel to different countries and wait months for a visa. You need to pay sometimes over five thousand pounds for a visa to go to Libya. Is that them trying to protect our country from the British going in to get more intelligence or possibly being spies, or is it because they just don't want to fucking see us in general because of the shit that we've done in these countries? Potentially, yeah, mate. So. Because look at Iraq, mate, look, the, the weapons of mass destruction, there was mm -hmm. none. There's over nothing. a million, oh, over yeah, a million people but... killed. And yeah. these are innocent the people. Where, where, where's, the, where's the outcry for that? And you see all the British and you see all these people supporting Ukraine and you see them supporting Israel, supporting Palestine. What about fucking supporting everything that Britain's done? Wrong oh, yeah. people. And do you know what I mean? Like, obviously, we are from here. And I don't agree with wars, but I've said it before. If a war was to come to Scotland, I'd be the first to get a pair of boots and a rifle to try and protect my own. So yeah, you can understand why people fight for their country yeah. because they don't want to be invaded by any other country. Mm. And it's not normal. In my mind, it's not normal. I feel as if people have a right to stand, but it's good how the media portray things of these wars and 9-11s and all the other shit of the yeah, day man. where you got to question and think did these things really happen mm. where now I'm not yeah. much it's, well, it's like a conspiracy not, but the media can portray something and everybody yeah, just it, jumps on board and supports killing innocent people it's not it's just weird for me mm. see when you're there and there how, what was your first stunt there how long did you stay yeah so in Afghanistan first time I stayed there was uh, for two weeks after a fall of course so I was just travelling around speaking to people getting some stories I was just enjoying it um, first time I was in Afghanistan I actually got threatened by a random guy on the street and also I saw loads of prostitutes around this was during the American occupation yeah, but that's why you're back so yeah. many times bro <laughs> so true no, no, I'm kidding I'll need to get a flight yeah, with you I next time I guarantee the Taliban looking at this it was a joke I promise you yeah. but um, so there's a lot of yeah, blast in that there as go, well when I go back man there's no prozzies the streets are clean People actually respect what I had no problems. I actually felt stupidly safe because there's a there's a tally bro on every single street corner just holding a gun looking out for danger, you know? And apparently during the occupation too, when the US were there, there was loads of ISIS around. They would do random bombings, you know, they were in Jalalabad and uh, coming from Pakistan or whatever. The Taliban, the GDI, their intelligence agency, they are on the ball with things because they they are trusted by every member of the community. We're in, inside Afghanistan so if someone hears something dodgy going on it does get passed down the chain of the public and they get you know uh, informed of this and then the Taliban do like you know take into custody any ISIS and at this point they've eliminated ISIS from most areas so it's pretty solid so they're doing quite well they are a little bit paranoid about the spies and everything and you I say paranoid because uh, you know sometimes they thought I was a spy and fair enough but to be fair, I did meet some genuine spies whilst in the jail, in the jail. It was a guest house. It was nice. But I met some people, some Afghans would come up to me and they would say, hey, mate, I'm literally uh, Afghan CIA. And I go, what? what? And they're like, yeah, yeah, this is my, this is my ID number, whatever. Uh, if you get out, please remember that number. We'll contact each other. I'm like, nah, mate, I'm, I'm not, I'm not a spy myself. I, I'm just, I'm just like here for not having a permit. Not really interested in that world. Sorry, mate. And he's like, ah, oh wink i'm like no 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 wink i'm like i'm generally not surprised like, yeah same i'm like oh fuck me i can't yeah, mm -hmm. deal with that so they are genuine genuine cia operating in afghanistan right now actively like a decent number and these people get paid 400 a month so it's kind of insane uh the taliban aren't considered a terrorist group like like you said 
The Americans are all about self-determination of freedom. And the Taliban are bizarrely like that too. I, uh, you know, I mean, most people are going, you, know, you can't draw that parallel, but hold on. You know, to them, uh, Bin Laden wasn't obviously part of the Taliban, part of this government at all. He was some outlaw criminal. And then he fled to Pakistan. And then Afghanistan got invaded by this foreign land uh, that they had no concept of, you know, and they just obviously were fighting for their freedom to run their government. Because they were the government owners. They aren't considered a terrorist network at all. No country considers them terrorists apart from Japan, I think. But if I if I bring a member of the Taliban here, it's no problem because they're technically classed as freedom fighters. So they're just blokes basically that are trying to defend their country. Like you said, if Scotland got invaded and you all created a group, you're not a terrorist, you're a freedom fighter. You're just def- you want your country run by your people and by the majority of the people and the previous government. It's crazy. It's, it's even when you look at the news back in the day, like Gaddafi and stuff. I was always portrayed that he was an evil man. I like Gaddafi. His country was run. The, the, what he done for healthcare and universities and helping out mothers and there was no homelessness. It was unbelievable. Oh, yeah. Now the place is upside down. Oh yeah, like I wasn't. You know, he's not perfect. Far far from it. No, but no fucking he, dictator, or leader, yeah, is or whatever course, you want to call yeah, them. I mean, we're not perfect, but yeah, you know, we bloody try. And I think it was trying. You know, you saw some interviews. He seemed genuine. And you could tell. You could tell what was going on in the international stage. He was just laughing at the UN meetings. I thought it was hilarious, man. Yeah. Um, he tried to create a gold back currency as well. Uh, I think you try to get away from the dollar, mm, and this yeah, as soon as that see, happens, see, you're yeah. gone. Exactly, yeah. He like, tried to give Africa a new, a new lease of life. Oh, yeah. Vince. So what I've heard, like I said, I'm not fucking expert. I can only watch yeah, a few right. videos and speak to enough soldiers and other people who've changed their perception of things. And mm-hmm. they tell me just that they was trying to get away with the the US dollar, I think, and bring yeah. I mean, Africa its own currency or something like that. Yeah. Well, that would have given them the control. That's the thing they can't do. It's like, um, do you know French Africa? Uh, all their banks... Uh, are controlled by France, so they're in France right now. So you, ha- they have to do all transactions, all business through France, and they charge stupidly high interest rates. So that's why places like, uh, like I don't know, the uh, sorry, the west of Africa, um, those those desert countries, the uh, like Maui, Maui and stuff, they just can't get a foot off the ground because their banks are pretty much controlled, and France is kind of reaping the rewards. And I get that to be fair, like you know, the whole colonization thing. I kind of get it. You know, if you control some nations, you become rich yourself. I understand it, but I don't exactly agree with it. You know what I mean? There's a better way to do it, but... It's crazy yeah. how, even in the world today, there's nearly 2 billion people without clean water. So how is that possible? How is that possible, the homelessness and the, well, the yeah. starvation of people all around the world, and more so Africa? It's, it's mad to think that 8 billion people on this planet with the resources that we have now, the food that we waste every day, oh, yeah. it's... And it's, um, yeah. I, I still can't understand that human beings are, are treated the way they are and oh, because yeah. of the people who control the it's, world and families or oh, whatever yeah. you want to call it. But it's, it's just, you, and we forget that sometimes as well, bro, because we're caught in our own life. We want our own family to eat. Yeah, and we, we forget we just about don't... the dist- even the homeless on the street. I do a lot of homeless, but sometimes you walk past so many, you actually forget that oh, that's yeah, a human. I, that's a that human being. Homeless. That's okay. someone who's sitting there, yeah. lying. He was once cold. a cute child. Yeah. yeah, really happy. Maybe the world at his feet, but that's someone sitting in the street, cold, alone, starving, dying. But yeah, we just walked past them. Yeah. It's fucking mad. Yeah, man. I mean, you, it, at most you threw them a few quid and it's not going to change anything. Yeah. Man. They get a bite to eat, maybe. That's it. Just keep them existing, mm-hmm. you know. It sucks. So what made you go back then? Oh, after do, the first time? You know, I thought, you know, I blew up from Afghanistan. I just want to see what's going on there. It was actually a genuine curiosity. You know, what's the government like? What's the country like? No one's touched it. But the visa has just opened up. A tourism visa, a business visa. Maybe I can go there. And I heard some stories. I thought to myself, you know, how do you make money in this world from going to these countries apart from YouTube and all this other stuff? And I realized when a new government takes over, when there's a drastic change of government, like uh, an overthrowing or whatever, like that's happened, there's a lot of opportunity. You can become the guy to do certain things or you can get government contracts quite easily, especially because. I don't imagine, you know, any business guys just popping down to Afghanistan, you know, just signing contracts and doing business. It's quite rare. So you can really make some money out of that place. So I thought, you know, I'm going to make some money. I'm going to do some business. I'm going to help everyone around me who's involved in it. Yeah, everyone gets paid. I get paid. Everyone's happy. I'm going to make some videos. And I'm going to be brutally honest. If the Taliban are good, 
I, I, I just be honest, like, uh, unlike most journalists, I say solid things. If I have a bad experience, I'm going to be honest, I say bad things. But I wanted to go there out of, like, little journalism, personal curiosity, business. Mm -hmm. Yeah. When did, so what way did you, what was your mindset like going into then what it is now about the people in? Oh, I think they're pretty solid, about, to be fair. The good people, friendly, loving, yeah, yeah, caring. But, yeah, man, Most majority of humans are when you actually have a one-to-one -one yes, with man. them. You know, yes. I've understood that. I've sat across from pure stone cold killers oh, and yeah. they became friends and I think, I like you. Oh, and, yeah, because yeah. you kind of Dope forget people, the man. shit. That, yeah, and it's mad. But what's, your, what's the separation you've got now from it, from when you first went to what you've got feel mm, for yeah. them now? Do you feel sorry for them? Somewhat, yeah, mate, because the issue is a lot of the Taliban, they haven't been to school at all. We haven't been to school, man. So a lot of them just don't know how the world works. And you look at their country. Um, here's, here's the thing, too. China has the northern provinces. They bought up $300 million worth of land because there's so, much min there's so many minerals there, $3 trillion worth. So it's the next Congo. And that could be a very bad thing. It could be exploited to hell in a bad way. It's what the Chinese are doing. They're trying to colonize it economically. And I walked around Kabul and I saw, you know, They've been cut off from the SWIFT network with sanctions. I don't know why. That sucks. You know, they're just trying to bank it, trying to, you know, just join the international community. And, you know, they've been pressured. They've been squeezed by the world. And I just thought to myself, you know, these people just don't know. They're literally sitting, uh, you know, 20 miles away. There's a site that's worth what, over $100 million worth of copper and gold. And it would be, you know, a £50,000 investment if somehow that got invested by the government or some lucky sod uh, who had that type of capital in Kabul, you could lift like a thousand people out of poverty, 10,000 people out of poverty through the job system. And I thought to myself, you know, these people, they know nothing but war. And it's really tragic. And right now they don't have the education to kind of... Question it? Yeah, yeah, question it. And the education they did have was like, you know, just, just uh, Western education as said by the Americans. So you've got people that have psychology degrees or sociology degrees in Kabul when they really need welders, builders, manufacturers, people that understand business, people that understand the new laws and everything. Like they need, it's going to get worse too. It's going to get so much worse. So here's a little secret, man. So I got told about this by some SAS dude and some contractor. When the uh, Afghans, the uh, the old government was sent getting contracts to build uh, buildings, you know, they would hire local firms and stuff. And they had this loophole where if the if the uh, building wasn't up to code in the concrete and stuff, if it wasn't mixed properly, they would actually knock it down and they would still pay you again. So it was not paid by the job, of course, it was paid by the hourly. So they would abuse this. They would build subpar structures and then go, oh, did see me. I mean, just knock it down, rebuild it. And they'll do that a few times. The Americans would just pay for it. You know, they would just throw money at them. They didn't realize it was a scheme. I mean, at some point, you know, after five or so attempts, they would go, yeah, we're just going with this. Screw it, screw it. We've got a deadline. I and mean, all these buildings in America, in the uh, in Afghanistan, especially in Kabul, are just not up to code. So right now, they're not going to last 10 years. They're not going to last 10 years. They're going to start collapsing. And these are high, high-rise buildings. And I've been in some of them. I'm seeing cracks. And I'm seeing things as like serious structural issues. And I'll send pictures to engineering friends of mine. I'll take a picture and send it and say, is this like normal wear and tear? Is this just from maybe an earthquake or something? And they'll be like, do not stay there, Mars. They're like, do not stay there. So I'm thinking, you know, there's been a big population boom in Kabul. It's gonna, it's gonna get bad. It's like either they're gonna have to, you know, really drastically change things, do some retrofitting or just start their own building. Right now, the Taliban should be on crunch time. There is a, a lot of work to do. Like I've worked in high stress environments where you have to get things done instantly. I'm that type of person. I work really hard. I, if I could, if I could meet the leader of the Taliban, I would go, hey, propose all this. What you need to do, you need to do, do blah, 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 blah. This how you assure your economy for like the next two years. There are no drastic changes, nothing where you align the West. But this is a game you have to play. You have to implement it right now. But they're sadly not doing it because... They obviously don't have like education from London business school and stuff. They're they're just you know trying to figure things out at the moment. I wish I could help, but how many soldiers were in Kabul? A few thousand. Because um, you talk about the population rising there, is that because the women were getting pregnant, or yeah, the because Ameri of the soldiers were there, or well, the Americans are just pulling money into Afghanistan? So some a lot of people had four wives, which is typical in Islam, and then obviously they would have ten children. 
her wife and you can see how that multiplied very very quickly because food was an issue and uh the americans were able to throw money i said they'll just throw money and everyone just saw this kind of bull run this endless growth so population just exploded and that's why they were like oh we need to build we need to build very quickly we need to build new houses so think about it if your salary in afghanistan was two thousand dollars which was the average salary for the average person houses in the city center were costing 150 thousand, like uk prices so you just think, you know, it, it was like, it was a totally out of touch market. It was completely inflated. It was one of these things where every contract in the US government, every contract in NATO was like, oh, we just keep making money, we just keep printing, we keep building money, 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 money. And then eventually it just all collapsed when the US left. Why were there soldiers in Afghanistan? Yeah, so you got private military contracts at this point. So the journalists, you know, they're, they're XAS, SAS types looking for an easy paycheck. They're just walking around, they've got a weapons license from there, you know, they, they apply, do all paperwork. Because uh, sometimes there might be a security situation that's needed and, you know, some some female journalist who's showing your hair obviously does need to be protected. And you got some people there that are just actually training the Taliban, you know, uh, on modern military tactics, some more stuff. So, What was the main reason the soldiers actually went to Tal uh, to Afghanistan? You mean uh, when the war first started? Yeah. yeah. So they had this whole narrative that, oh, wait, Bin Laden's in Afghanistan and the Taliban are like harboring him. We need to go right now. We need to do it. 9-11 was terrible. We need to go, we need to go, go there, go take over. Super easy, super easy job. Few months in and out. No. So if you look at the early transcripts of the Americans talking to the Taliban, the Taliban were eventually like, hey, well, we'll help you find Bin Laden, but we need some assistance. You know, obviously we're very... Uh, we're not we're not you know a unified country at this point we don't know where he is we can't hand him over but we're hoping to find him at that point Ta afghanistan was an information black hole there was there was no communications there was no uh phone lines most of this stuff was just you know it was a black site so the americans were like yeah screw it we just need to invade so i think the taliban at that point were like hey we're not well versed on international politics but we just know a terrorist thing happened. So, you know, we don't agree with, uh, you know, a 9-11 going on. We'll help you find Bin Laden, but we, we need some help here. We need some assistance. And the US was like, yeah, screw it, just invade, just invade. And everyone was on the narrative of Bin Laden's right there in Tora Bora in some cave somewhere. The Taliban, uh, his friends, we just need to invade Afghanistan. Yeah, screw it. Everyone was hyped up. How many people died there? Too many, man. Thousands. Thousands. So I think it was a couple of thousand Western people, which is quite low for... Um, a war that happened over 20 years with pretty much the whole of the West going there. It's pretty crazy to think. Most people were very upset about that. 2,000 people dying. I'm thinking over 20 years, that's nothing for a war. Because in these countries, on the opposite end, you have like millions of Afghans dying. Yeah. Millions, man. And to be fair, no one sympathizes with them because of that. And I can kind of see it, you know, I mean, to think of it from their perspective. You're just chilling in your village when suddenly some foreigners who just are completely ideologically different are allowing prostitutes and weed and alcohol in. And uh, yeah, you see the cracks. Like, we see in England right now. We're seeing cracks in memorials, you know what I mean? So we're, they were seeing the same thing. And it says in their holy book, which like, they live by, saying, hey, we should protect our group no matter what, you know, protect the homeland. And they're like, crap, I have to fight. You know, I need to put down my life for this whole thing. So, yeah. So you back again? Was it easier the next time you went because of the experience you had the first time? Yeah, I I wasn't scared. To me, Afghanistan's like popping out to Tesco's, mate. <clears throat> so for me, it's it's solid. I went there, and I was just chilling. I had no I had no fear. I was showing my passport. I did everything by the books. You know, I talked to these people, and they warmed up. They were just chill. They were very nice. It was solid. I had some scares at some point. So what happened? So I went to this one area where I wanted to open a gold mine in Afghanistan. I'm still doing it. It's doing the works and I've got some investor meetings, big if true, you know. It's, it's, oh, yeah, money, money, money. Um, but at that point, I was just checking out the site. I was looking at the leaked US documents. I was like, okay, so there's meant to be gold here and these are the coordinates. Okay, I'm going to pop down to the site, take some photos for some investors. So I went down and the village elders uh, quickly conversed, uh, converged on me. They, you know, they pointed guns at my head, said, get down, get down, get down. I was like, okay, I'm getting on my knees, you know. Just, mm. And they were like, you come back, you come back, you, 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 you fiend. You know, they start swearing at me. I'm like, come back. What do you mean? First time here, mate. And they're like, you flee to America. Then you come back uh, after what you did. I'm like, what do you mean, mate? And I find out through some, some discussion. So American dude raped a girl in the village. Like some American soldier dude or some businessman. So before I was America, I was like, no, 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 check, check my passport, British dude, 
I'm all chill. Not the same guy. Check my name. Check my photos. I'm a YouTuber. I'm a businessman. I apologize about what happened, but that's not me. You know, we're different people. And they checked everything out and they discussed it amongst themselves. Yeah. And they're like, oh, it was not the same dude. Just some white, just another white dude. Sorry, I saw, I saw, uh, I saw, uh, I just, I'm just relieved as hell because I thought, you know, gonna be executed there and then or in prison maybe. And then, uh, they they just like oh yeah sorry about that get out of play they brush the dust off me and they they you know, had their hand around me it's like hey I'm gonna take you to my house I'm gonna get you some grapes we're gonna have a lovely time I'm gonna get you some chai I'm gonna apologize what are you here for man we don't get visitors very often you know it's it's actually a place with no electricity like they're living in uh, not mud huts but it's you know made from the ground you know it's not modern building techniques these houses are hundreds of years old. And now, and then uh, I just discussed about my gold mine, and they're like, "Oh, we want business here, yeah, yeah." So uh, we're actually up for that. You know, you, you can talk to us. Here's my WhatsApp. Uh, we'll show you around the site. This type of stuff. So that was the only scale I had, but the rest was just solid, man. It was a lovely holiday. People think I'm absurd while saying that, and yeah, it's absurd in the real world. But who wants to live there? Yeah, exactly. Yeah, mate. Again, you went back. How long did you stay for that time? Oh, a few weeks. So. First, second time. Is every I, time you went, you've stayed longer? Just a few weeks, yeah, a little bit longer to be honest. I kind of start liking it, you know, if food's Does good. Does that feel like home for you now? Second Somewhat, home? Yeah, because in the last year, man. Have you ever felt like you've had a home though because of the life you led? Nah, to be honest, no. To be fair, like, university. It's not settled, but you've always been. Yeah. Well, the closest thing I've had to home was my university town at Loughborough. So, you know, I, I went to church there regularly whenever I was home. And, uh, you know, before I did this whole travel thing, I would go to church almost daily. So I loved the community there. I loved, uh, you know, the uh, the priest and everything. Can't say his name. And there was this one restaurant I frequented, which is just it's it's Korean barbecue mates. It's solid. I love that stuff. Oh, I can eat that all day. So I'm friends with the owner at this point. He loves what I do. I love what he does. You know, we could swap jobs at any point. I would get free food. He gets travels. But um, you know, I just I would always go between these two places. Plus, my friends were still at uni. They were doing PhDs at this point. So you know, we're the same age. We're just chilling. Yeah, I liked that little thing. I would come home for a few days each month and I would just chill there and then I would head back out. That was my home. That was my home. But right now, because all my friends have now finished their PhDs because it's a year later, and because obviously I've cancelled my housing contract, my rent in that place, I'm thinking right now, you know, it's not a nice town. It's not solid. You know, it's not somewhere beautiful. It's, you know, modern architecture nonsense. And it's full of students and yeah, it's a bit weird. I'm 24 and I'm not going to hang around students. So I'm thinking to myself, you know, it's time to move and find a new home, you know. But I think, I guess my home, as cheesy as it sounds, you know, one single tier now. I guess my home it are my followers, you know, they, they are my family. <laughs> Do you think their personality keeps you alive as well with the kind of chilled, friendly vibe that you have? Because it's kind of quirky, it's kind of... Goofy, yeah. yeah it's it's kind of, whimsical, is that, is that silly, yeah. who you the character you built up through the years yes mate so when you go to different places you do put on a little bit of a personality so if i meet a posh person like an investor like i'm meeting an investor on monday i'm gonna put on this accent i'm very posh no problem you know mm -hmm. but if i'm talking to you all right mate proper sick yeah <laughs> yeah yeah it's like you know it's it's you know that side of you different sides of you and when i go to these other places i i speak in a certain way not out of manipulation but just I know it works, you know. I know this is how they understand it. I know that's what type of stuff that works. If I go to Africa, I speak in a different way, very direct, use some metaphors that they would understand. Uh, just because that's how life is, you know. There's different cultures, and if yeah. you go to that one country, you gotta respect the culture, and you do pick up upon it because you're surrounded by these people. So you kind of adapt a little bit. You know? Different faces for different places. This is a game. It's survival mode as well. So every guest I speak, I wouldn't say different all the time, but I can interact and adapt to every single guest yeah. no matter if it's the killer the drug lord the guy who's in afghanistan <laughs> the woman who's had a hard life I'll tr i would try and adapt to their needs because it's energies see i think that's why people like you and follow you so many people man you see some other youtubers who just fall off or you know like if uh like ethan klein you know those types of people they do terribly but because you adapt and you respect the other person and you are you know, solid and actually to be fair quite humble I've got to be even off camera thank you that's that's why people follow you because they're like he's a real guy you know he's, he's solid he's not fake he's not lying or just genuine 
Just try to do your thing. But again, we're all it's full right. of we're all full of shit as well, bro, aren't we? Yeah, man. We yeah, are all full of shit. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Even though we say we're good in this, but there's still an element of yeah, psychotic some, mad bastard. Should, up should I tell you the manipulative shit I did to get my vest and bag? Yeah, job, man. Because I was like, you know what? If you're going to business with like a like a big corporation, it's fair game to kind of pull strings. You know, it's nothing personal, whatever. It's all part of a game. So I I got uh, so this is a little bit of a story I. So when you apply for investment banking, they basically send you an online test where it's, it's an IQ test. They say it's not, but it definitely is. And I would I would go to the library in my university. I would create like 50 different emails and I would go through this IQ test with blank CVs. I would submit blank CVs, blank details, and they would automatically send you the test on the email. I'd start it, I would screen record it, and I would categorize every single question from a question bank. And I would keep doing these tests about 50 times and just to make sure I am get, getting it right. So when I do it with my real account, with my real application, I get the highest score possible, you know. And that's not manipulative, that's just preparing. But I did this and I actually got through every single question that the company had, and this is a big firm. And so I, I memorized all the answers and it does vary a little bit, like the values vary, but the methods for getting the answers are all the same. So I go through everything and I obsess over it for three solid days. I don't sleep for 72 hours and that's, I have some sleep problems to be fair. So I just, I just work, work, work when I'm, until something's done, I just work. And then it got to one point where I did the applications. I would never get to the next stage, no matter how well I did. So it automatically tell you, say, sorry, you're not eligible. And I'd think to myself, oh, this is trash, you know. So at one point, I'm you know, it's at the 70 hour mark and I would look at it and I'd think, what am I doing wrong here? I'm getting most of the answers right. I'm getting like 95% correct, 98% in some cases. And I realized at the beginning, they, there's a diversity quiz. And it says, you know, are you, what, what race are you? What color are you? Where are you from? Are you male or female, trans? And what's your sexual orientation? I was always pointing out white, you know, white straight male. Afterwards, I put down like uh, trans, uh, you know, blah, blah, blah. I just put down a bunch of diversity stuff. Suddenly, I got in because I was apparently gay. So then I got to the next day to be interview. <laughs> yeah, I got to the next day to be interview for my real application. And then, uh, you know, they, they messaged me saying, this, this woman's going to interview you. So I, they gave me 72 hours uh, before the interview. They say, yeah, this, this woman, they give her full name. So I searched through the company's LinkedIn. And this is like a big company, over, over 100,000 staff members worldwide. But I spent hours searching through every one of their LinkedIn from different departments. And I find this lady working in HR. You know, she works in recruitment for that company. That's my lady. So when I stalk her social medias, you know, this is all happening with a few hours. And I find out, oh, she's obsessed with this one book. She's raving about it on Twitter. I quickly buy the book off Amazon. I skim it. And I put it on a shelf behind me during the interview. So it's like on camera right now. It's right behind me this book and I keep referencing I'm like you know I really agree with this one investment strategy used by XYZ person and she's like oh you love that book too wow wow it's amazing oh we're the same I'm like so true we, you know, we, we really do get on and then before the interview and I pull some strings like that too you know, I'll just see what she's into whatever you know, how she talks and before the interview and she said oh you know um, I wouldn't worry about doing any other applications and I go you know, but that's manipulative as hell. That I basically stalk someone and manipulate them into getting a job, you know, by just lining myself with their mannerisms. That's the type of stuff you gotta do in some in it the world. Must, yeah. man. That's a survival mode out here. Yeah. As long as it doesn't come across where you're fucking standing outside their door in a pair of pants, waiting for them to come out. Do you know what I mean? There's, oh, there's yeah. always tricks and techniques to get yeah. jobs and to be the best and trying. And even everything's pretend it's all pretend oh, yeah. we're all fucking pretenders exactly we're if, all pretending bro in if, life it's all pretend I've got to me if you go higher up in the world like if you go into the bankers the lawyers the doctors the CEOs I've met a lot of these people they are psychopaths they're psychopaths or they're just really autistic you know mm -hmm. um, but they are crazy and it's survival of the fittest a lot of these people too they don't harm people they don't they don't obviously uh, they're not Patrick Bateman they're not going around stabbing people in the back quite literally but they're ruthless. Yeah. You've met those people too, are soldiers. Yeah, I've done yeah. bad stuff back in the day to try and survive. But now I do is everything's legit, but there's more ruthless fuckers sitting in the suits who blatantly do in front of your face that they're going to fuck you over. Oh, of course, yeah. And that's you think, what? Like I've got that I've got that goofy, kind of fun loving personality going, you know, and that works. I can absolutely be ruthless when yeah. it's needed. You've I think I think you can see that. I like to be transparent about it, but my friends know not to fuck with me. See, I'm the same, sense. mate. I'm a good guy. I'll speak to everybody, give everybody the time of day. But I've also got that other side 
A mm. side I don't like to go. A side if I do go, only if it's necessary. Yeah. Only yeah, if you because I think yeah, it draining. Hope for wasp that, that, yeah. that wasp side is shit. draining. That side is tiresome. Yeah, but sometimes it's a needs must. We go wait a minute. Okay, let's see. Bang, flip the switch, and then people go whoa. Yeah, exactly. Don't know, but don't have to, you do shoot because I give everybody respect if they yeah. deserve it. Mm. Do you know what I mean? And if they don't deserve it, I'm not interact with them. But yeah. some people will try and take the person. You think okay. Yeah, you, you, you want to push me? Yeah, absolutely, yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. You just you just show them, yeah, don't, don't mess with me, mm -hmm. 100%. So you've been to ba yeah, Kabul, in and out, you've made friends, you've got your contacts, yeah. you're shooting guns, you're buying guns, $100, dollars i seen, was it $100 for one yeah, of the guns? Yeah, yeah, uh, you could go to the market. AK-45s AK AK and machine yeah, guns? Yeah, machine guns, PKMs, uh, um, what's it, M16s. Anybody uh, could buy yeah, these guns? Right, so you need a license sometimes, but... Uh, you know, as long you can go there, you can go shooting. Apparently, uh, as long as you go through proper channels and everything, you do everything legally. So when you go to Afghanistan, absolutely, it's not one of those places where you get away with things. You need to do everything by. So the I'm books. surprised at that. I thought everything would be the backhanders here and get no. everything that you wanted. At this point, at this point, there obviously they're, there's always going to be some dodgy stuff going on. But they're like, hey, we've got a country after 40 years of war. You know, the Soviets and the Americans. We want control of any everything to make sure the security situation is good. Then we go improve things and then slowly give freedom just like how south korea had uh you know started out they were really poor then they became prosperous i hope to god afghanistan makes a lot of money becomes well and opens up to freedom and all this other stuff a little bit more freedom i'm not talking you know prizes on the streets freedom but you know just you know you know typical stuff yeah but uh yeah that's that's how it is man so when did you get captured when yeah, man. So I was I was with two mates with mine, and we were we were talking about the gold mine. We were going to meetings with the Taliban and stuff, and we were halfway between Jalalabad. I call Jalalabad good because I love that place, and uh, Kabul. And I had a house in Afghanistan at this point. <laughs> yeah, really moved up in the world. Yeah, not homeless, but living in Afghanistan. Um, and I went to a Western Union to take out money because, God damn it, the US have sanctioned uh, Afghanistan. No SWIFT network, no bank cards work. So please change that if you're watching Joe Biden but um i i took out a thousand dollars and over there that's like half a year's salary maybe more so it's the equivalent of in the uk just walking to bang yeah give me 20k you know so obviously i raised some red flags some guy the teller makes a phone call behind the scenes and then they're, they're at hedge stage see gdi are waiting for us outside you know they point guns at us and they go hey you've been detained don't know why you were drawing this money we've had problems with spies with espionage come with us we need to question you but you know you're not officially arrested you're not uh, in trouble we go preacher like guests just give us a few hours to run your details and we go yeah fair enough so we just sit there in a room they look checking our passport they're inspecting it to make sure it's valid same with a visa i think that's solid you know good due diligence and with me they received some intelligence from russia from the russian government saying i'm a potential weapons dealer because I keep going to the Ukraine front lines for journalism and they keep going to Afghanistan, they think I'm buying up US weapons and sending it to Ukraine. Obviously not true. I'm not a weapons dealer. I'm not the Lord of War. You know, that movie, I'm Lord Mars. So uh, they might have gotten mixed up. Um, so we're like, you know, we have to escalate this, Mars. You know, you have to spend a few days in custody when we really have to do our due diligence here. So I'm like, but on the way, they're like, yeah, we're really sorry this is happening to you. Uh, but, you know, we just have to check everything out. You seem like solid blokes, but we don't make the decisions. We're going to take you to a restaurant just before we, you get taken to the, uh, you know, holding cells. We're going to give you a nice little time. It will take a few days. So we had like a solid meal. They spent a two-day salary on us just to feed us. I mean, afterwards, we obviously gave them for money to say thank you, you know, because we're not going to let them pay for us. Mm -hmm. And we get to this one place and we realize, oh, crap, we're in like a... Taliban holding cell you know it's not so, it's not it's not a great place you know it's not exactly a resort so my friend starts crying on my shoulder you know because he's got a girlfriend back home he's like oh I think it's one of these things that happens my friend is just you know freaking out a little bit with me I'm just thinking it could be a lot worse you know what I mean it could be a lot worse you, you don't need those friends mate they, they cry baby once yeah, they make well, things one worse of them, one of them this is his first time outside of Europe <laughs> So it was an interesting time. Uh, long story short, they wanted to see if I was, uh, the Taliban wanted to see if I was a uh, soldier. So they handed me an M16. And they, there was about eight of them in a room. And they said, Mars, we want you to test if it's loaded or not. You know, how would you do that to see if I'm competent with a gun? So like the autistic uh, guy I am, I give the M16, I check it out, turn on full auto. And I point over the Taliban's head, click. Obviously, it doesn't fire. Not could give me a loaded gun. I then point over the roof of my mouth, click. And I go, not loaded. 
uh, and they just start bursting out laughing. They're like, this fucking guy, you know, uh, just a bit goofy. And they start questioning me too. They check through my phone. And you know, when you have a bunch of memes on your phone, mate, some really weird but funny stuff, they were questioning this. They were like, what does this mean? I'm like, how do I explain this? You know, because these guys, uh, one of them didn't speak fluent English, kind of like good conversational. I was like, how do I explain like I funny LARP and all this other stuff? Um, so I, I just couldn't explain some of this. And they were like, okay, well, you seem chill. But we've only got one problem. Obviously, we don't think you're, uh, you know, we don't think you're a soldier. We probably not a spy, but we need to check this one thing out. Where was this? And it was a mountain in Kabul where we went for uh, checking out the gold mining site. And they would say, do you have a permit for this? I said, yeah, I've got this permit. And they were like, no, this is, this is in this category. So you need this permit. You didn't have this permit because of this area. I'm very sorry, but you did commit a crime. And I fully accept that. To be fair, I, I, I fumbled. I messed up. So I, if a type I'm watching this, I actually do genuinely apologize. I did mess up. You got to respect for rule of law when you go to a country. And I screwed up a little bit. But it was a very small crime. And they were like, it happens, to be fair. You know, you're not doing anything dodgy. Mistakes happen. And we believe you're solid. And then my friend gets interrogated too. And I don't know why he did this. I don't know if he's saving his ass. I don't know if he was being malicious. I don't know if he just got really nervous and screwed up. Or he he kind of was just a bit too tired. But he said Miles might be a spy. Yeah, he's not too tired for that, mate. He's a snitch. Yeah. Well, it wasn't a spy. Is that the well, cry, that the cry, that the, that, that the cry baby? Oh, one of them, yeah. Yeah, you fuck him off, mate. Don't yeah, speak yeah, to him I'm again. Not, I'm not too fair. His name is James. He goes in uh, Nottingham Uni. He... Uh, but what they've done is saying if you tell us he's a spy we'll let you go no not even that they were like wait you think he's a spy he said he might be and they were like looking at each other like wait, maybe he knows something they're not they didn't even push on it they were like oh, that's, that's a solid reason we can like you know, keep this investigation going obviously now we've got real concerns we were thinking Miles was solid because we've seen his YouTube work before he was a solid dude but it would make sense if he was a spy it's a good cover you know, to go places and he gets to film stuff. That's a solid cover. Uh, there's some YouTubers I do know who have been offered by different governments to like spy. And I never have, to be fair. I don't fit in a category. But yes, they, they were like, hey, Mars might be a spy. And to be fair, at that point, there was obviously two other British men that were arrested who were convicted of actually being genuine spies. I don't know if they admit it or not. But apparently they had some solid evidence. I do believe them when they say they did. So they think, yeah, it wouldn't be crazy for a third British man to be a spy. So see if you admit that, is it a case, okay, that they've got protection if they admit they're a spy or it could there be a case they could get executed? They could be executed, to be fair. So when... when is that a law there? Yeah, so when we got released, uh, it's, the Chinese government do this too. If you are convicted of being a spy without, without question, without doubt, uh, you go through, there is a chance of execution. So... Uh, what well, with us at the moment because it was kind of a first diplomatic incident between the British government and the Taliban government obviously they were like we're just going to keep you in a holding cell now the other men that got arrested for being spies like without doubt and they were ex-SAS too so it would make sense and one of them was actually ex-intelligence in Afghanistan just openly admitting it uh, he ran a hotel but he was a solid bloke I liked Anthony. him Anthony can't tell you his name mate uh, I had a guy on last was it last year Anthony but he was I spy his missus was an interrogator, but when uh, the armies left Kabul, um, there were still soldiers left. They took their passports and shit. They couldn't get out, so they had to go over and, yeah. and get them out. But he was um, a spy, but he got captured. But there was tactics that they used to use on the phone and say certain words to get back home. So people, yeah, it's, yeah, it's mad how they operate. But yeah. it was it was weird. So the people who you got jailed with, did they get released? Yeah, so those two other British men, uh, they were in a different place, so they weren't liked by the Taliban. Straight up, they called, they were apparently really controversial, uh, really, you know, they didn't play uh, a good game. You know, they they were convicted of being spies of our doubts, and they were just wankers, apparently. So they had caused a lot of problems. The Taliban put them in the harshest jail. Obviously, they weren't they weren't tortured or anything. You know, they were just given uh, normal treatment, but they weren't you know Ritz Carlton. You know what I mean? They were just you know in a holding cell. They got to the exercise, uh, but you know they were just like your spies. You know, spies what you do. You know, you're undermining our government. Just push it to one side. With me, they questioned me for two weeks extra. So I was sitting in this guest house. It was actually like a normal house because they were like, if he's not a spy, we want to treat him well. Obviously, we don't want to put him through any trash. You know, because he is still a guest until he's proven 
guilty. So the Taiwan didn't kidnap me. It wasn't a secret police. That's what some of the news headlines say. It was a formal arrest. It was a formal investigation. They were very solid with conditions. And they questioned me and they were like, Mars, we know you're a spy. Just admit it and teach us your techniques. So you get to go. And I was like, oh, sorry, man, I'm not a spy. And they were like, hey, Mars, uh, if you're a spy, we'll literally pay you a million dollars if you tell us our techniques. You know, just tell us right now. Just admit it. And obviously, they're not going to do that. It's just uh, terrible. They've not technique. got a million dollars anyway. Yeah, well, to be fair, some of them actually do. It's, do they? Yeah, yeah. But, uh, long story. I'll tell you about that in a minute. And some of them do like, Mars, we found evidence that you're a spy. If you do not submit it, you're going to spend many years here. If not, you're going to spend six months, you'll be out. And I was like, no, spy. And uh, every time I was like, I was explaining things, they were talking through my business. So like, why do you do this? Why do you travel here? And I was like, hey, business, business, look at invoices. I kept records of everything, thank God. And they were also like, you know, how old are you? I was like, at the time, 23. And they were like, okay, so you know, we, we got evidence that you went to this university and you left to this point and you're, you're military age male, but there was no time in your timeline where you could join the military. And they considered everything. And they were like, we don't think he's a spy. And then they play back the audio recording of my friend saying, you're a spy. And I was like, holy crap, he betrayed me as hell. And he was the one in charge of my finances at this point as an emergency kind of contingency when I was obviously not home to look after my business and my rent and stuff. So James really screwed me over at that point. And, you know, I shouted out at him over the phone when I had a supervised call. And the time I included, hey, there's always going to be a small chance he might be dodgy, but we're going to keep an eye on him. We're going to you know, talk to him some more but we've discovered miles he has written a book about us and said good things and he said honest things i'm not a propagandist i just said the truth my personal experience is he's gone here five times he's been solid uh you know his only crime that we have on him is that he didn't have a permit like you know it's like jaywalking in america it's like whatever we like this guy. We, If he is who he says he is, we think he's solid. You know, so we're going to give him good treatment. He's going to be in the best jail possible. Uh, so when I was meeting with one of the commanders, what happened was I got taken from the guest house, taken to this tropical garden. It's the height of summer. You know, it's green all around. There's peacocks in the background. There's loads of food on the ground. We're all just sitting there. And they're like, Mars, we don't think you're a spy. We don't think you're a soldier. You do a small crime. You're going to do a little bit of time. But we want to keep you cushy. We want to keep you happy. You're a solid bloke. I'm like, the Taliban think I'm a solid bloke. Oh, yeah. <laughs> and they go, what do you What do you want? Are you arrested a thousand dollars? Sometimes with, when you're arrested or something, we can give it back to you. So here's your thousand dollars. You can ask, we're going to give you some servants in the guest house. Therefore, all the people there. But if you want something off them from the market, you give them the money. They're going to give you the correct prices and I'll bring it back to you. So, and then they also said, oh yeah, uh, anything else you want? I was like, yeah, I've got my laptop, my friend's looking after it, but if you get it, you can spend a week searching it, but if you find nothing on it, give it back to me, and I just want to watch movies and write a book, and they were like, actually, yeah, if you want to write your honest experiences about the book, we have no problem with that. Um, yeah, you're not allowed phones for security reasons, but you're allowed your laptop, you're allowed to take photos of your webcam, just don't take any photos of the Taliban, and if you do, just censor it. Have a solid time, man. So... Honestly, things were, it was good treatment. It was a, it was a big, crazy process. I met some crazy people. I met feds. But that was the initial few weeks. Are you thinking content, though? Are you thinking business? Because that's what yeah, I would be thinking. Point, I'm thinking, I, for me, I've got the fucking jackpot here. Exactly. I'm in yeah. prison. No, I'm, you're, you're so correct, man. You're solid on that. At first, I was like, oh, it's so over. And I was thinking, okay, what am I going to do with my rent? I'm going to be out in a month, maybe. You know, I thought I had these ideas that I was going to be out super quick. And I got a little depressed at some point, but then I was buying myself pizzas. And after a while, I thought, you know, this is actually, I'm, I you know I've read some stories. I've read some stories. I'm the best treated prisoner in Taliban history. I'm like, I can make something out of this. I'm like, I need to come out on top in some way. And there's an opportunity here somewhere I can feel it. So after a while, I went to the Taliban. We would actually have regular meetings with these people. And I would meet up with them and I would pitch the idea during... They, they did have some more questions for me after they started digging because my Twitter goes on forever, you know. And I started pitching my gold mine. Like, it was like a business meeting. They would be questioning me. and I would be selling them my story and my idea, my vision. And they were like, what's that guy? They were like, he's the guy who can do some business in Afghanistan. So I'll talk through the geopolitics of this. The Chinese, as soon as the Americans left, brought up $300 million worth of land in the northern provinces to do mining for copper and gold or whatever. There's a ton of stuff there. The US and the Soviets took geological samples. They have a whole uh, mass of documents showing this is where the gold is, this is how much gold there is, this is how you mine it, all the data's there. So we know where all the money is. 
just no one's ballsy enough or no one has the connections to do it. The, the Afghans don't want the Chinese government taking over the whole of Afghanistan because otherwise it'll be like Africa. They colonize it through economics, right? And the Chinese aren't really interested in the South because they've got the Belt of Road Initiative. That's the only reason it passed through Afghanistan. And no Western government uh, or mining corporation wants to touch Afghanistan because there's a conflict of interest and also because they've done work with the US government so they're ineligible and they don't have the connections. You know, so... I'm the guy. So they straight up said to me, said, hey, Miles, after this, if you decide to come back, which we hope you do, you could be the bridge between the UK uh, you know, uh, economy and the Afghan economy if you really want to. You could be that fixer. You could be that guy. And I said, I'm your guy. <laughs> you know? And there's two words you always, uh, that you should learn in Afghanistan if you ever have a problem. It's called, uh, it's mushkinishta. It means no problem. <laughs> so at that point, I think, screw it. Uh, I said, hey, Download me some economic documents that I want to read on my laptop. I'm going to start doing business. I'm going to start planning for this stuff. If you don't mind, I want some regular meetings with you guys. I want to plan this together. If I'm stuck here, fair enough. I'm very sorry about the issue I caused with the, with the uh, documents, with the permits. But I'm going to goof off and have a lovely time here. So I basically had loads of economic documents and movies downloaded on my laptop. I realized the stuff I could buy from a bazaar, I could get anything there. So I was paying people for more movies, for music. Uh, I had my Bible on my laptop. I was chilling. I got whatever food I wanted within reason. Um, what was the food like? It was solid, to be fair. Some days it was, you know, it was rice with uh, seasoned well with salt and spices. We had some chicken, some beef. Do you have a worry that it could have been poisoned or anything, or was it not that deep? No, no, it wasn't that deep. No, here's the thing too. In the house, the Taliban, so they would get delivered a pot of the food, like a pot, and then you would get some bowls and some plates, and they would serve it to us, so they'd, they'd give us the other uh, detainees the food first. How many people were in this house? Eight, some came and go, but around eight. How many prisoners? Around eight prisoners, about eight Taliban. How many? So eight and eight? Yeah, basically. Could you have escaped? Yeah, I could have jumped out of a window at a time, to be fair. I Why didn't you? Because you thought, fuck it. I thought, yeah, fuck it. To be fair, if I escape... This is life, this is what I've dreamed of. I was like, to be fair, it's a, it's a lovely internet retreat, you know what I mean? It was like, wow, I am, I'm actually doing my taxes right now. I'm kind of catching on stuff I would do anyway. You know, if I'm going to get out soon or like in a few months, if it's under a year, I'm happy with that. You know? when, did you, when did you find out how long you would actually be there? It wasn't a solid thing. It wasn't a sentence. So they said we could give you the minimal sentence, and I thought that was six months. But after six months passed, I freaked out, man. I was like, crap, this is not going to be like a long term thing. I thought, you know, I heard stories about people being held in Afghanistan for three or four years. I would express my concerns, and the Taliban said, no, it would not be that long. I'm very sorry, Miles, but there's some bureaucratic nonsense, some paperwork. You'll be out soon, bro. And I, I didn't know if I could believe them. You know what I mean? Uh, so I wasn't entirely stuck in syndrome. You know, I was like, you know, there's there's a few parties involved, and the party that matters is myself here. You know, so I need to I need to make sure. So I did have an escape plan. It was all planned out, and I could have escaped at any time. I I, I was like, okay, I'll go through these mountains. I know this area. I know this area here might be a smuggling route. I go at night. There's no fence in this area here. This will take this many days. And then at at some point, I didn't I didn't need to execute. I I promised myself, no matter what happens, no matter how good t- uh, of terms I am. If I get to one year, I jump out of a window. I, I escape in the midst of the night. I had, I had I had loads of plans. So I had one pair of clothes I've never worn before that I'd wear, so they wouldn't know what I was wearing. Um, I thought, okay, I'll grow my hair from this point and what little I had left. And when, when I get out, when I jump, I'll shave it so they don't recognize me. Uh, you know, I just thought constantly change my look. They, you know, I, had, I had insane plans. It was good stuff. I was really thinking about this as a backup. You know, I wasn't like, wow, it's a holiday. I was like. I am technically in custody here. I'm enjoying myself, but freedom is important to me. You know, does that make sense? Of course. What was other prisoners like? Yeah, so a lot of them were just actual spies. So I can't say what nationalities they were from, but there was one guy. There was one guy, and you can tell from the accent where I'm set, what where he might be from. So I met him in the holding cell. He came in. He was a big black dude, very very bulky, uh, very fast, but also very wide. So it looked like he worked out, but let himself go a little bit. Uh, six foot six and he, he walks in and I'm like oh hey dude how you doing man uh, what are you in here for you speak English he was like yo fuck white people what the fuck are you doing what are you talking to me you Muslim you white dude no you infidel you I'm a terrorist I'm ISIS I'm Daesh I'm I'm Taliban I'm like 
what the hell, this guy, you can tell he's loopy from the start, you know, his brain, whoosh, 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 whoosh. So I'm talking to him and then he starts getting threatening. I'm just, I'm just like, I'm not scared of you, but what, what's the angle here? What's he doing? Is he just straight up schizophrenic? It turns out, yes. And then the Taliban come in like, what's this shouting? What's the commotion? You know, you need to be respectful to your other prisoners, to your other detainees. He stuck a punch for Taliban. And you can tell, you know, you can tell what country he's from. He's crossed the pond, you know, he's from the US. So I can say that, I guess. And obviously he gets detained, then he gets put in handcuffs because he's fighting with everyone. Uh, he gets put in solitary for like a week or something. And I found out he's in the guest house when after my friends leave and after my interrogations are done, I'm allowed to interact with the other prisoners. You know, it's like, you know, you can walk from room to room. And it turns out this dude's obviously by himself because he anyone he's with, he causes a lot of problems. But I talk to him through the wall occasionally. I just talk to him. I'm like, I'm like, hey, man, um, you know, what, what are you in here for? And he starts opening up a little bit. I think he's desperate for some, you know, contact or whatever. And he tells me he came to Afghanistan from America with American citizenship. And he believes he's ISIS. He wants to join ISIS. So he's going to Afghanistan and join ISIS. So this guy's radicalized as hell. He's crazy. And he used to be in the US Army in Iraq. And apparently he saw some crap and apparently he killed some uh, Iraqis, you know. So he's charged with killing some Muslims, which makes sense. You know, if you're a soldier, you go back to Afghanistan. What do you expect? And he says he's Muslim. He's been Muslim for 10 years. Can't recite a single line of the Quran. You know what I mean? Like, even if uh, non non Christians can recite, you know, in the beginning there was uh, there was you know no light. You know, the whole initial Bible Genesis thing. So it's very suspicious. You know, he he I keep thinking he might be a Fed. You know, he might be a real weird Fed. And then turns out he also wanted to get Afghan citizenship. He came to Afghanistan to give up his U.S. citizenship. He thought the embassy was open for some stupid reason, and he was trying to marry a five year old. But yeah, exactly, to uh, say, you know, to marry himself in the citizenship. And I kind of paused, obviously, because I was a bit dodgy marrying a five year old mate, no matter your intentions. And then he just, he said, he said, he started sweating balls, you know, I could see him through the crack in the wall. And he said, uh, not to uh, not to have sex with her, though. <laughs> you know, just darting his eyes. And like, every indication from his body language is telling me this guy is lying. And I go, have you been in prison before, mate? And he goes, yeah, in Thailand. I'm like, well, what were you in prison for? And his eyes dart again. He's like, not not having sex with children. And I was like, what the hell, this bloody guy, you know, he's like a straight up schizophrenic pedophile looking to join ISIS. And he tells me he wants to become a suicide bomber and he wants to like wear a vest and, you know, all this other stuff. He's just loopy as hell. And I started talking to him a little bit more. The next day, he told me all this within one day, by the way, and some other stuff. And for other night, he just talks to himself. He's talking to Joe Biden and he's talking to Kim Kardashian for eight hours straight throughout the night, just arguing with himself. And I'm like, you've been here like less than two weeks, man. What the hell? You know, you haven't turned crazy from this. You came in here schizophrenic. You know, you came in here insane. You're a danger to yourself straight up. And kids. Yeah, yeah. And kids, everyone. Everyone he's around, he's a danger to because this guy isn't like meek as hell. He's like contra- uh, con- confrontational too. He used to be a boxer as well. So he's, you know, strong. And he also, uh, he he told me some other stuff. He told me, uh, so when I started speaking to him in front of the Taliban, you know, he told me, he was like, I was like, how you doing, man? He goes, oh, yeah, so the chip in my brain and the chip at the end of my dick, uh, it's degrading because I'm away from the satellite. So the satellite is still beaming mental images into my brain. They keep going, ah, you know, it, it was all messed up stuff. It's, it's, I'm kind of laughing to myself a little bit if it wasn't so tragic. And he believes he's Michael Jackson's long lost son. And he believes he's a famous rapper. He was like, Google my name when you're out. So I did. And he's, he's no one. I found his Facebook too. And he just, he just, uh, he just believes he's talking to like ISIS. He says, when I make a Facebook post, the terrorist attack that I demand happens. I'm like the leader of a huge network of Al Shabaab and ISIS. Uh, I tweeted out recently that, um, oh, sorry, posted on Facebook recently that the Burj Khalifa should be 9-11. It's going to happen. I'm like, I'm like, my friend, why would you 9-11 for Burj Khalifa? It's a Muslim country. You know what I mean? Like, if you are a terrorist, you know, wouldn't you pick somewhere else, mate? You know what I mean? Like, if, you, if you're thinking that mindset, you know, it doesn't make sense to me. And he's like, you're not in the jihad mindset, man. You do not understand me. You do not understand me. I'm the best Muslim here. I'm like, mate, you're a prisoner. And you're not joining the Taliban. You're a prisoner for the Taliban because you've done some serious you know, crimes. And he doesn't believe it. And he goes to the commander afterwards and he doesn't call them by, the commander by his name. He doesn't learn any Pashto, not a single word. I'm learning Pashto and 
uh, and, you know, he's just he's just sitting there doing nothing all day apart from reading the Quran and stuff. And it, he goes, Taliban commander, uh, I don't want to be deported. My government will kill me. Joe Biden speaks to me through the chip in my brain and Kim Kardashian too. They're trying to steal my hundred million dollars. I want to invest it in Afghanistan. And the commander's like, right. You know, just a bit. <laughs> We'd sort of exchange your eye contact. Like, this guy's loopy as hell, man. And then... You know, he goes, I don't want to leave. I don't want to leave. I want to live in Afghanistan. Can I, can I be released and not deported? And they're like, yeah, sure, mate. No problem. You will be deported. And he goes to me and goes, you will be deported, obviously. Uh, this guy's loopy as hell. Like, he's too crazy for the Taliban. And uh, they go, they go, you know, what, what do you do in America, my friend? And he goes, uh, I am American Mujahideen. And he's like, there is no American Mujahideen. What are you talking about? You're talking nonsense. You're talking how you ass, my friend. The Taliban like getting upset with like this play guy. It's almost entertaining to them. And he's like, no, no, I'm a big terrorist. And and to be fair, we don't know how he made money because he had about a hundred grand in crypto on his phone. Because they were like, hey, Miles, can you explain crypto to us a little bit more? You know, the Taliban were like, you know, explain some stuff. They show me his phone, and I was like. You know, how's this guy got all this money? Because he's schizophrenic. He, it, we, Could that I, have been an act? Yeah, I was thinking, you know, I did a whole psychological analysis on my laptop. No joke. I wrote down everything he said, uh, just for my own personal records, out of curiosity, and, you know, just for the book. And I was thinking he could be a Fed, because these people get paid through crypto, the Feds do. That's what I've heard. Um, the other Feds I met get paid through crypto too. And I thought to myself, you know, he could be, he could be just a Fed, you know, just dedicated to the role. But speaking to yourself for eight hours a day, every single night for eight months straight, man. I just don't know, man. I just don't know what he was doing. I don't know what his game was, but it wasn't working no matter what he was doing. He wasn't making friends. Everyone in the house hated him, even the Taliban. At first, they were like, hey, he's Muslim. That's really good. We respect that. For American Muslim, wow. And after a while, they were like, this guy's a bit, bit, bit messed up, you know. So I have sympathy for him because obviously you don't choose your mental disorders. I, what my theory is, he went to Iraq, served a little bit because he was broke. He, he made he made some money, you know, and he maybe went to some private military stuff. Maybe went down a Fed route. I don't know, but it messed up his brain somewhat. You know, he's clearly not all there. It could be an act, could be not. I just really hope he gets home. And if he does have problems, he just gets the help he needs because you know that's very rough in America. And if he is a Fed. Bloody hell, I hope, I hope he gets fired, man. Um, but he was like, he was just proper weird. Imagine having hundreds of thousands in, in crypto money just for no reason. He also had a bank in Afghanistan with about $7,000. So he went for Taliban and said, Taliban commander, can I take out $7,000? And that's how the money in Afghanistan would be like this much of a stack. You know, it's bigger than the fucking angle on the camera. I don't know what he was spending on. He's going to be there maximum for two years, I believe, maybe. But I don't think the US government want to help him get out, if you get what I mean, because he's he's a trouble case. You know, he's he's a bit crazy. He tried to join a terrorist network. If at the very least he's gonna be convicted of something back home. Yeah. He's got big problems, man. What was the embassy in that scene with you and what was the media and everything oh, like yeah. over here? So the Taliban were quite good with that. They allowed me to have weekly or monthly uh phone calls to my friends, uh to not the media but to like the embassy staff. So there was no embassy in Afghanistan that was Screwed up. That's why my European friends for EU passports got out so quickly. Day 13, the talks went on very quickly. But the, the embassy in Doha had no diplomatic ties for the Taliban. So we just didn't know who to contact. First phone call I had with them, I was a little bit frantic on the phone call. And they they just straight up said, we don't know whose phone this is. We don't know who Taliban, uh, who's ta which Taliban we're speaking to. We don't even know. And I was like, you do realize, you know, this phone belongs to the... Uh, uh, what's it called the um, um, the head of foreign intelligence, and they stopped for a second. They're like, "Uh, tell us his name." So we just didn't know they were speaking to a, a big guy in Afghanistan. I was like, "Crap!" If he, if a whole team in Doha that how dedicated to Afghanistan do not know this basic stuff, wow! You know, I was like, I was like, yeah, you know, I'm screwed, man. I'm 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 dealing with bureaucrats at this point. I'm, but they would they would call me and do like Miles, do you have clean water? Do you have do you have do you have like more than two liters of water a day? Do you do you, do you get bed? Do you, are you in chains? Are you being you know, are you being in, uh, you know treated well? And I was like, yes, mate. I've got like water. I've got like 
I've got like energy drinks, I've got like Pepsi, I've got like chai, I've got like orange squash, orange juice. Oh yeah, I got like a cushy bed. I got in my favorite color. <laughs> you know, all this other stuff. And you just sit there like this fucking guy, you know, uh, because they know who I am. They're like, you know, they're annoyed about me. I guess they've seen the media reports, and they're like, they're like, legit. You get treated that well. I'm like, yeah, man, I made friends, and they just stop and they think. This guy's obviously just uh, having to say this stuff. So afterwards, after when I spoke to a phone office, they were like, okay, man, I know you have to do that act, but tell us about the real conditions. I was like, nah, it's all right, mate. It was exactly what I said it was. And they were like, goop. <laughs> um, so best treated prisoner in Taliban history. The media, as soon as they found out I was kidnapped, they were like, idiot tourist goes to Afghanistan the second time. They didn't do their research. They still think I'm 21, by the way. They still can't Google my name and my details. 21-year-old student goes to Afghanistan. Idiot gets himself arrested. Reckless, psychopath, you know, all this other stuff. And then as soon as I it gets revealed through my Twitter, some friend was tweeting on my behalf when he found out my good conditions. He said, hey, Miles actually enjoying himself goofing off. But he, I think one news, uh, news company reported on the good conditions. All the others were just, nah, nah, it doesn't fit the narrative of idiot guy, tourist screwing up. So we're not going to report on it. You know, we're not going to report on the Moles' win. We're going to report on only potential L's. What was their step to get out? Yeah, so basically, when the six-month mark happened, they said I was meant to be released then. But they said, literally, we're sending physical paperwork between Doha and Afghanistan. So that's our problem. Plus, we want to release all you guys at the same time, all the other British men. Turns out there was a fourth British man. I got arrested. And you know what he did? Apparently, he found out about the other three British men who got arrested. And he literally just walked around Kabul with, pit with our pictures and went to random Taliban. Said, Where have these men been held? And obviously, they were like, hey, what, why are you asking that? That's, that's dodgy as hell. We really need to rush you now. So that guy got arrested. And the British government was like, oh, okay, we need to talk to the Taliban. We, we, we actually need to discuss things. And after a while, they were like, okay, well, these men aren't welcome again. Moles are right. Uh, but you know these other men uh, they, they shouldn't come back and after they w created some diplomatic channels it wasn't like an exchange where some guy was traded for someone it wasn't like that no money was given it was actually just people sitting down bureaucrats talking and negotiating and trying to bridge build bridges like you said that's how it should be and they were like okay Miles you were meant to be released of a six month mark that's a minimum sentence but sadly you know we two months of paperwork my apologies you're released now and I was like yeah solid the other, the other two British men spent 10 months and one guy spent five months. What was that feeling like getting out? Well, I thought I was going to be given some advance notice. So I thought I was going to uh, you know, celebrate and you know, splash out some cash and you know do the sh handshake of everyone. I was given 12 hours notice. So I was like, crap. So I had some money remaining on me. I went to the Taliban and I'd grown close to the other prisoners because some of them just didn't have passports. They lost them and they were stuck there, you know, uh, bureaucracy. So I was like, my friend... My tally bro, buy me like five pizzas, buy me all this stuff. We're having a pie now. So me, the Taliban and I, the other prisoner detainees, were celebrating. You know, we were having a nice meal. Uh, we were enjoying ourselves. It was sad to let see me go because I had a laptop on me. So they were relying on me for movies. And I'd grown close uh, to the house servants, the guests, uh, the guests and also the Taliban in general. Because they weren't the ones that determined my release. They treated me stupidly well. They treated me like a guest, a brother. Felt like I was staying in a hotel. So I was generally sad to see them go. I'm actually in some of their group chats now. So that's fun. You know, we just chat sometimes, sometimes FaceTime. But it was kind of sad. And and also because I was getting released towards the end of winter, I was like, ah, I got I wish I got released in spring, maybe, because then at least I'll come out of a great tan, you know? Um but I was like, obviously, I was like, hey, obviously, I do want to go home. It was just I wish it was done differently, you know. So then I met with my the top commander, the guy who runs an entire province, you know, the head of blah 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 GDI so I met with him and we had a celebration and I went around the headquarters of their intelligence agency they all knew me at that point because I went to their monthly they were shaking my hand they were like had me on Facebook here's my whatsapp mate take a photo of me chill with me they were really kind they were like hey if you want to come back we can have dinner yeah and I was like coming back in three weeks and they're like we don't believe you and I was like I promise you I'm coming back in three weeks and they were like you're that guy they were like you're solid we're fist bumping and then they were like, okay, uh, they gave me a full military convoy with the Taliban. I was in one of those bulletproof SUVs, uh, you know, with with fire suppression, all this other stuff. And there was about five trucks transporting me, you know, looking after me. Took me to a, a kind of another guest house to wait out because if there's a, an attack on the convoy, very unlikely. But then, from who? 
from ISIS potentially. You know, there's always a security concern, even though it's very, very unlikely now. But you know, they just want to give you 110% reassurance. And then they take me to um, another ha- uh, another halfway house, and they say, "Okay, you can spend the night here, Miles. Um, here's all your stuff back that we had with you. So here's your iPhone." I'm like, "Wow, I haven't held this in a while." Uh, and then they took me to the airport in the morning. And I met the, all the other prisoners and they were really pissed off. And British prisoners were pissed off. And the like the head of the ministers, the ministers of like uh, your foreign affairs or something were all there seeing our departure. And they were speaking to us and they would go to me and they'll go, Mars, you're right to be fair. You're you're invited back. But these men, they're spies. I'm like, oh. So they were gossiping about the British guys to me because they thought I was that close to the Taliban. So it was very bizarre, but I was like, that's pretty entertaining. And again, I was just getting their autographs in my book. And I was like, hey, uh, what's that me if you want? I'm coming back in three weeks. Love to meet you. I would love to buy you a equivalent of Mackey's or something. And you know, I'm, I'm a, you know, it's a lovely story. I'm kind of kind of really outdid myself here. I'm kind of proud of it almost. Um, yeah, you know, I did good. I did good. What's your opinion on the Taliban then? Now that you've become yeah. friends with them? I think they're solid blokes, you know. I mean, they aren't perfect, like every government organisation. Some of them are bureaucrats, some of them are moody. Some of them just don't like foreigners. Some of them think I'm cute. <laughs> you know how it is, yeah, in Muslim countries. But most of them are just solid blokes, you know. Some of them are just looking to, you know, check in, check out, uh, have a happy time, you know, just chill. Some of them are just looking to watch TikTok with you and just talk to you some of them are looking to do business with you some of them are looking uh, to make sure you have a good time they have this moral obligation for islam to look after you i'm like you know i'm not muslim myself of course i'm very strong catholic but one struggle brother you know it's like you know you're you're solid blokes i like you guys you're treating me well i'll go thank you and when i go home i'm going to tell you the truth to the world and they, they were very happy with that. They were like, hey man, if you saw anything bad, if you saw any dodgy stuff, if you uh, see anything that's not up to scratch, you tell us, you can tell the world, no problem. Tell the world about experiences, but give us some feedback because we're looking to always improve. And I'm like, I respect that immensely, you know? What's the difference between ISIS and Taliban then? Yeah, so ISIS are monsters. I met a member of ISIS while I was there, by the way. So the difference is the Taliban are obviously more liberal. See, I didn't really know. I thought it was kind of all under the same umbrella. Uh, they despise each other, mate. So that's a common misconception. I totally understand. I thought that before I was doing all that stuff. ISIS are just, we kill every foreigner. We don't cover, we, we, we just kill them. If ISIS had enough military power, they came to England, England is just genocided. 100%. In, England is finished. But I, you know, if the Taliban say we're at a war with England, they're like, now nah, we just care about our homeland. Nothing else. We're not, we're not going out for US uh, or for England to invade. They like outside of it, like guests. They, they respect other religions. So they said to me, oh, Miles, you're, you're Catholic? We know about that. We actually study that stuff. For that job, you're fine. Do you want a Bible? Do you want a Bible whilst in there? Uh, do you need any religious uh, things like beads, prayer beads? Do you need that? Is that what you do? ISIS would just be like, oh, you're Catholic? On your neck. Straight up. They, they will torture you. They take everything crazy, crazy serious. And they are monsters. The Taliban are very chill in comparison. They, the ISIS are just full fundamentalists. Like if you took everything literally in their holy book and only focus on the war stuff. So the Taliban have a big uh, uh, thing against uh, ISIS, of course. You know, And they've pretty much eradicated them. The guy I was dealing with, he's killed 200 ISIS members uh, and left them in the streets of Jalalabad as a warning. Uh, because... You know, saying ISIS is not welcome in Afghanistan. We are looking for safety. We are looking for Taliban control. No one, no one will oppose us. No one will create security concerns for foreigners and guests and women and children. The Taliban think you're a spy. You end up befriending them. Yeah. Going back over to see them. Could then, they the still Brit- think- could then the British then think you're a spy for the Taliban? Oh, that's a good one, mate. Honestly, I haven't been... I, I got debriefed very quickly. Um, they... they I think the British, obviously, you have some good capabilities with technology. So they see on my phone, I've been to church ever since. They see I constantly go to church. They see I post Catholic stuff on Twitter. Everything shows that I'm probably not a spy, to be fair. Like, I'm, I'm working with the British government. I don't even stay in England for long. So I think they're probably like, we'll keep an eye on Miles. But it seems like he's just trying to make money, just do his thing. It seems legit. It seems legit. You know, they 
they obviously come through my financial records. I've been interviewed a few times at airports. And every time they find nothing. When I went to South Sudan, they stopped me, you know, uh, counter-terrorism. And they, they sat me down. They were like, you know, what are you doing? What are you doing in this country? You know, what are you doing? Uh, you're doing anything dodgy? You're buying guns? You're, you're doing this stuff? You're shooting people? You join a terrorist network? You're starting a terrorist network? And then they search my bag and they find like five Bibles I'm going to give to a church. And they're like, uh, okay, yeah, off you go, off you go. <laughs> because they had all possibilities. Because yeah. me speaking to you, I speak to enough people. I can read people. And you're very calculated people think you might be daft and think because of your quirky nature people might think that it's the eyes isn't nah, it nah it's because if you're in with Taliban and stuff the way you can keep calm that's a different layer, that's a different skill the and, same as myself yeah. I believe I would keep calm in those situations where good, okay man. listen I'm sweet listen let's, let's speak but for me it's you're very I would say you're intelligent everybody's got an intelligence but you're very I'm calculated to it yeah, yeah I don't know about that I think you're very intelligent where you I know could, how to pull you, you know how to manipulate game, the situations yeah, to play yeah. the game to survive to yeah, then get information that is possible yeah. so even though five bibles in a book it could be because you know people go ah he's a good because of that nature yeah realises you get fucking four AK-47s well, in your bag and six grenades yeah yeah well I'm not exactly book but you know yeah. the, 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 yeah. that nature of you you're, you're, you're on it you're switched on to it you're very yeah. let's just say everything I've, is like a chess game for you to be fair, yeah, you're right. I have a lot of contingencies. A lot of the time, people on Twitter... Do you have photographic memory? Sometimes. Yeah. Sometimes, yeah, I'm kind of... It's how I did well in physics. I just... Things just made sense, you know? And mm -hmm. that's a bit different. And I can't relate to a lot of people. Like, I understand them. It's just sometimes I just don't like them, if that makes sense. Yeah. yeah. You're different, bro. You're yeah, di yeah. You're, you're different. Like, um... Not in a bad way, but you're, yeah, your like, mind... What I, I can feel your mind works differently. Yeah, exactly. Like, I'm, I'm playing a long game. You know what I mean? Yeah. Um... Like, I remember when, when I got arrested, I told my friend, I said, hey, go into my house. You'll see on the hard drive, there's a, what, a 30 page contingency document I wrote out on exactly what to do if I'm in this situation. I've planned for this type of stuff. I've got contingencies for everything. Like, the whole front of Twitter is, oh, goofy traveler, he, he, he. But of course, behind the scenes, I'm. You know, I'm, I'm writing up documents, I'm coding up uh, documents in latex, uh, putting together pitch, docu put pitch decks and investor relation reports, and I've got hedge fund investments, and it's going quite well, you know, like, there's it's some boring stuff, and it's not always impulsive, like, I've got every country that requires a paper visa or an e-visa, I've got the applications all done, by the way, I've got, like, a stack of papers with all my passport photos, it cost me a few hundred quid, but if I need to smear a visa tomorrow to go to say, I don't know, um, Mali or whatever, I can submit that straight away. So I've got everything planned out. I, I am love to be ordered. And it's kind of hard. You know, it, I'm not perfect. I wasn't like back in the uni days, but I want to make sure everything's very systematic and everything is covered. The only issues I have, I find, it's not getting shot at in Ukraine. It's not the Taliban. It's not even ISIS. It's bureaucracy and dealing with other people because they aren't on the same kind of not level, but not in the same mindset, if that makes sense. They're very emotional. They're very emotional. And I, I understand there's always a time and place for emotions, but for myself, you know, it does not help a lot of the time. Yeah, I don't feel as if you would show a lot of emotions. I don't know if that's connected to your past and what you've seen with your mum, but when was the last time you cried? Mm. Mm. I had like a little sob in 21, but that was just a very little thing. Proper crying... You've switched off, huh? 17, yeah. 17, I had to think then. Should you become cold? To the, not cold, but I, I genuinely think you're a loving I can, person. I can but do, do you feel as if you've just cut off all barriers where yeah, nobody completely. can get in because of the shit that you went through as a kid? No, I, I got close relationships with uh, with some people. I've dated some people for two years and they've got very close. I'm very open. I'm very open. So, you know, if you say this stuff, I could, I could obviously hide it and control the narrative with you and say oh no it's all good man no i just i just you know it's just how i am it's goofy no no i'm being honest here i am very calculating when it's needed and to that i can very much control the emotions sometimes obviously i get stressed a little bit angry but it's it's like it's like it's like a punch up a boxing bag and that's it it's, it's natural like, life bro yeah man it's like i don't take but it you out seem to handle anyone. it well but you seem to probably just close it all off and think yeah. fuck it i'm just going on to the next yeah. day it's like i saw my friend crying on my shoulder and high about prison i was like there there i'm like why is he crying I'm like, yeah pussy <laughs> yeah, yeah, no, i'm just there like 
bitch. <laughs> no, he was he was sorry. He was worried about his girlfriend back home. I get that. Yeah, I get you get that. that. Yeah, yeah. We're all yeah. built differently. We've all go through different levels of pain and trauma. Who make is who we are today. You don't know somebody. You could meet somebody the love of your life in a few years, and it knocks down every one of those barriers, and you see the world totally differently. Again, yeah. we just all work on, but we we deal we play the cards the way we yeah. fucking deal them in. Yeah, because. People always ask, you know, why do you go to these dangerous countries? How do you deal with the Taliban? How do you deal with blah, 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 other agencies? And at the end of the day, they're all people. They have wants and desires and they have things they don't like. Everyone could be befriended. Everyone can be reasoned with. And if you're in a bad situation, everyone could be manipulated, you know? I wouldn't, like, I remember I was in Ukraine. I was in a bad situation. They thought I was a Russian spy at one point. They would interview me. And I obviously was like, hey, I'm, I'm not going down this route. I'm manipulating straight up. I'm just pulling as many strings as I can. I got, I got off very quickly. You ever seen the film Catch Me If You Can? Oh, I love that film. I was, I, it's kind I, of I, resemblance, yeah, yeah. Yeah, it's like um, when they used to meet the girls, yeah. they used to get to the bank and manipulate oh, yeah. the girls and get them. Then before you know, it, he's finding out all the information oh, out managed, the checks I've and done shit. Like so much stuff like that. Nothing, nothing dodgy. Nothing like uh, you know, not hurting people, or, uh, getting sex or nothing like that. It's just pulling strings, uh, you know, in business so I can actually get an end goal and it benefits them but it's like I, it's how I get a foot in the door if that makes sense of course so it really does work out um, like for example uh, what, what's something I can run up oh, it's kind of difficult um, yeah for example I had a friend uh, who was a bit of a slobby psychopath type you know he was a bit crazy he would suck a punch a random guy whereas if you're calculating you would you would slash the guy's tires after five days you know uh, but this guy would straight up, uh, you know, he, he would he would say, you're my friend, Miles, but he started showing cracks. He started betraying me majorly. He started causing a lot of problems. And then at one point, I just approached him and I lay across uh, a memory stick and I said, here you go, man. I said, play that tonight. And he called me frantic, like, what is this? And I go, listen, I've seen some cracks for you in a while and I know you know a lot of stuff that could cause me problems. And it's nothing dodgy, but it's like, you know, you're just, you know, you'll make me pay taxes maybe like that maybe more taxes you know what I mean so he go so I, I give him this memory stick and so all you're recording of him saying slurs racial slurs and stuff I'm like you're still a you're still in academia I know all your lecturers I could send this across you could have a huge controversy on your hands uh, you know you would be kicked out of university you would lose your scholarship you're not going to go through your job you're never going to be hireable again you have to change your name if you're really aligning yourself against me for no reason just because you're cocky as hell and think you can get something out of me, you know, completely think again, I can absolutely destroy you. I have good contingencies for you. This is only the first step I'm laying down upon you. You do not want to mess with me, play this game because you have never played the game before. I am on top of you. I am five steps ahead of you. If you fuck with me, I will completely demolish you. And this guy just goes, fair enough. And just <laughs> obviously leaves me alone. I've had one girl at uni lie and say i've never met this woman before. I, straight up i never met this woman and she straight up said to me over the phone uh whilst tipsy i can create a fake rape alle allegation for you i'm like holy shit you hear about this and you you know if, if you get a rape allegation in uni you're obviously fucked i've never met this woman thank god i audio record this conversation like i do with some conversations that seem a little bit you know spotty and i go to the uni straight up i say hey, listen to this if anything comes up, she she's lying. And apparently she had a history of this stuff. And a few people come forward because I was well known at uni and apparently some other men actually came forward like a men me two things said, hey, I've been falsely accused by this woman too. Apparently she's bipolar. Straight up dinos as bipolar. And I didn't have sex at uni. I had sex with well, one woman before becoming Catholic. So I really pissed off some people, you know, especially when you were famous at university. So I had a lot of people who did not like me. A lot of people who did like me. And I'd always make sure they would never cause issues. Even with the university too, I'll talk about this one, one story. Uh, so there's, there was this physics lecturer, and I can't say his name, but he was, he was a former libertarian, so it turns out he actually was a pedophile and a rapist. So he would go on Tinder during COVID, and he would, cat, he would post himself as a woman. It was a really bad profile, and he would catfish random guys who were very vulnerable during COVID, you know, 18-year-old kids who were just isolated and depressed and had anxiety, maybe autistic kids. And he would invite them around as a woman and they would let themselves in. The guy would lock the door and say, hey, I'm a, I'm a dude, but I'm, same, I'm the same person, want to want to get down and dirty. And the guys got pressured into it and some of them obviously got raped. It was rape, it was disgusting. I despise that stuff. 
I found out through my confession page, someone messaged me saying, I don't know who to go to, but I need uh, someone anonymous and you, you, Miles, you know, you have these connections with the university. And it's like, this kid was scared crapless. And I put the word out, I was like, hey, has anyone ever come across this profile on this Tinder account? And I had like 10 guys come forward. It turns out there was this lecturer that, who was actually teaching me computational physics, uh, you know, Swift, I think. Um, with, he was teaching me and he was like a full-on rapist pedophile. And I was like, fuck me. It makes sense he was a libertarian. Joking. But um, I went for uni about this and the uni was like, okay, Mars, thank, uh, thanks for bringing this. They weren't really grateful, but we're going to let him go, but you will not go to the media about this, Miles. You will have trouble. I'm like, I will have trouble if I expose something. Like, you can't talk about it, Miles. You will lose your degree, pretty much. I'm like, okay, I understand it's a whole reputational thing for the uni, but I just, I just don't like that, you know. But I don't go to the, I don't go to, uh, the press, obviously, you know, whatever. I just, I keep in touch with the people and I say, you yeah, know, whatever. And then the uni, after a fall of school, causes me some problems. They say, oh, well, they certainly find problems with my coursework all of a sudden. You know, they say, oh, you were colluded. No, I did not. No, 100%. I was doing all the coursework myself. I was solid on that. And then they said, okay, Miles, you've caused some reputational problems for the university. And they lay the case in front of me. And I have a big meeting and my friend's with me. And I have, I have actually speak to some lawyers at this point. And they say, we've received 12 complaints about you to, from the general public. And you know, we find we found five negative social media posts. I'm like, who gives a crap? I pull out a thousand positive posts from my followers and I slam it on the table, a piece of paper, slide across it. It's a ratio thing. I mean, you're being ratioed right now. I present my case very professional and wearing a suit, and they have nothing. They have nothing. They they see just say, You've caused reputational problems for the uni. And they're trying to kick me out. They just don't want controversy. They don't want their name in the papers. That's why. Mm -hmm. Because every once in a while I would say, Miles Routledge, Loughborough University, 21. And it got to a point where I just laid out saying, hey, I've kicked out a few lecturers. I know a lot of secrets about this university. I know that if it gets in papers, you having a pedophile lecturer, if you kick me out, I will absolutely do this. You do not want to mess with me. You're going to let me finish my degree. And they just looked at each other like, are you blackmailing us? I was like, yeah. Yes, I am. And you know what? Uh, they said, okay, well, you're going to take a year out of uni if you want. I was like, I have a gap year anyway. And you have to do diversity training and you can't publish a book. And obviously, they cannot legally do that. So, you know, let's say right now, I might be putting together a lawsuit with a few friends who's had similar experiences. So, you know, long game. What was it like? But, for but, uh, I just dropped out of uni after that. But I have all the documents. I'm just waiting. Long game. But, Listen, if you want to expose it, you're more than welcome yeah, on the podcast. You bro. have to be calculating. You have to be entirely calculating with this type of people. Because in life, a lot of people try and screw you. And of course, when you meet strangers, you just be kind, you be genuine. You help people when they need it. So you're homeless people, you give them money and do whatever you can as a, a Christian or something like that. But if someone tries to screw you, you have to have no nonsense, even if it's your job, university, or uh, I don't know, a foreign government. Yeah. What was it like coming back for the first day? Yeah, so I went through Dubai. I went through Dubai and the foreign office staff were waiting for us. Some really nice women. It was the first time I saw a woman in like, eight months. I'm like, oh, you're cute here. But uh, yeah, yeah. I was like, oh, hello. Um, and uh, basically we went through the airport and they were like, okay, Miles, you sent us some messages through the foreign office website and you've done some supervised calls of us you requested a bacon cheeseburger six months in advance here you go my friend i'm like i love you guys thank you so also thank you very much to the foreign office if anyone is watching you you are good guys even a few of you are bureaucrats but you know the rest of you are solid um they they sat us down they gave us as much food as we wanted said hey we've got a card here with like a limitless thing Go and buy anything you want, like drinks, uh, you know, uh, we could give you a hotel room to freshen up, we give you fresh clothes just in case, you know, have any bed bugs or something like that. I didn't, it was cool. But, um, they, you know, they, they really did look after us and we went through Dubai airport security and they did a, you know, a, um, explosive residue swab test. So, you know, they take your hands and, they, and close. One of the prisoners, one of the British men, had been staying in a cell that was actually used as a storage lot for, uh, explosives. So, put it in a machine beep 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 you know six men come on us we're like standing around us come with us sir you know this guy thinks he's gonna get a finger up the ass you know to search um 
yeah, we explained that situation. They're like, oh crap. And obviously the phone office is like, oh no, this is part two to the imprisonment. Everyone's freaking out. Everyone's making calls. Turns out half the uh, British men, because they were suspected of being feds as well, half their electronics were not given back by the Taliban because, you know, they're fed stuff. So they're freaking out saying, I don't have my personal laptop. I don't have a mobile. I can't call my wife. Everyone's panicking. So we, we get boarded, our flight gets cancelled, so we're not allowed on the flight. So we rebook the flight twice, but he keeps failing, failing the swab test. They search his, uh, you know, and they find nothing, but they're still trying to keep us. After about 19 hours, the guy literally goes, okay, I'm going to change clothes one second, I'm going to go into the equivalent of Primark. And he just buys a new set of outfits, has a shower in one of the hotels. He comes back and he goes, hey, um, do you mind if you swab me, test, test me again? No reason at all, just swab test me. And of course, find nothing. There's nothing on there. So we're like, oh, yeah, you're free to go. No problem. And the Dubai people would chill. But that was my first day. You know, just sleep deprived. And plus, I didn't sleep that night when I was in Afghanistan on my last night. So I was 48 hours no sleep, just kind of, you know, blinking. And the first day I got back, I I spent one day, I went to my friend's place, the one who got me, uh, I went to James' place, the guy who got me arrested. He apologized and, you know, made me food. And he was chill. And he was actually quite nice to catch up, to be fair. So I'm never going to do business with him, but he's going to be someone I just talk to sometimes. You know, the right? guy who says you're a spy? Yeah, man. To be fair, we had four years of history. Hey, he has really pulled through with some things. He obviously massively fumbled with that. What was his stuff. excuse? Huh? What was his excuse? He said, I was just under a lot of pressure. I don't know what I was saying. I'm very sorry, man. He's like, is it just, than he's admitted that he was a pussy? Yeah, he's, he's, basically. He's, like yeah. He's never done this type of stuff before. You know, he's scared. He's, yeah, you know, I thought he might For me, I would never speak to the cunt again as it's not yeah. my caliber of... They're not solid enough. Yeah, I think because he's doing a PhD in uh, not I'm he's, living elsewhere yeah, now. But he's concerned about he's concerned about himself. Yeah, if yeah. It's I a mean, team effort. Of course, if you're yeah, in there, you're he, in it together. Yeah, because he knows I've got audio records and recordings of him saying slurs. Yeah, same mm -hmm. thing. He, I could totally screw him over. I, he knows that. I just say, hey, never, never fuck me over. I'll never fuck you over. You know, it's like a uh, nuclear option. Yeah, you know, it just keeps the peace a lot of the time. But this guy, uh, this guy, you apologize. Do you feel that though? You have to keep friends with certain people because it, they might know certain things about you that they could expose. No, not a lot of the time. But if I start seeing cracks, I keep thinking, okay, I need to, I need to back up. Back, yeah, I need to back up. Just Sad reality things. though that yeah, there's always need yeah. to be a backup yeah, to date the people. Yeah, because some people just want to become friends with me because I'm famous. Some women just want to sleep me, with me because of that. It's tragic. So when I go out on dates, I can't say what I do. I just say, I just say, oh yes, I'm. I'm a negotiator for private government or something like that. I just make up some st uh, story and it feels scummy because you can't reveal yourself. Because if I go, oh, yeah, I've got hedge fund investments. I hang out with the Taliban. <laughs> Your women are like, what the fuck? You know, but you got, you got to ease them into it, you know, this whole thing. So you got to become very artificial. And of course, the only you find this out too, I imagine, with yourself. The only people you can really become close friends with is people that you knew previous to this whole thing. But of course, at university, I was famous. But I would never actually befriend you. I would keep to myself and just work hard and network too. So at the same time, you know, it's like I've only got a select group of friends I can really trust. And some of them don't want to associate with me because of the uh, whole media things of that as well. You find out who, who are really friends and who aren't. So it's a little bit crazy like that. So you kind of, you can never let your guard down, if that makes sense. Like yeah. when I meet my priest, absolutely, I can let my guard down there. When I meet one guy who's just really harmless you're one of those guys that you just chat shit to and just have fun with and you know talk about uh small things on the internet or whatever he's harmless i think once a month he's he's the most harmless guy in the world really autistic you know i just love that guy uh, i've got some girls i talk to they're just they're just you know meet up once a month talk through their problems they don't they don't highlight my stuff they're not looking for the whole travel money uh wow you're you're so dangerous type of thing yeah they're chill but new people, I think to myself, I think, you know, if if I w didn't do what I, if, if I was doing, if I was just a everyday investment banker, humble investment banker, joking, but um, if I was just a normal guy, would you become friends with me? But if I if I fall off one day, will you still talk to me? And a lot of, a lot of the time it's no. Obviously, it's a transactional thing. A lot of the time. It's like it's like I'm friends with a lot of YouTubers because I'm in the same world of them, but if I just DM them as a stranger... I would have no relation with them. I couldn't get in with them, you know. So it's very tough. It's I've spoken to a lot of YouTubers, a lot of famous people, millions of subscribers, and they are lonely as hell. I'm not. I don't think I'm lonely. I'm, I'm a little bit. I'm not. I'm not uh, 
extrovert and introverted bizarrely like I want a cabin in the middle of the woods somewhere just do my own thing not Ted K not the Unabomber type little cabin but you know just keep to myself visit a village every once in a while but a lot of the people I know are lonely and uh, just don't know who to trust and yeah. I think I can I can weed people out but it's still it's still stressful you know all the task. social media shit and you're, it's all fake as fuck mate it's all numbers it oh, doesn't really mean anything of course, mate, of when course. you break it all down you strip it all back who are we yeah, it's just, it's, it's all artificial, mate. Yeah. I can see why mental health is so messed up nowadays. Social media is fucked up. Yeah, mate. Honestly, um, I just don't know, man. It's like, I'm built for this type of stuff from my childhood, I guess, and maybe genetics, I don't know. Yeah, you know exactly what type of person I am, don't you? Yeah. Yeah. What about when you came back to the UK? How was the press? Yeah, so one of them tried to screw me over. She, she, I was, you know, um, in Dubai, I was messaging the press who had messaged me beforehand. And I said, hey, yeah, first exclusive, how much do you want to pay? You can get some photos uh, with me you, when I come back. Uh, you know, I tell you the story. I give you some exclusive photos from uh, when I was in Taliban prison. It's not the story that you think it is. It's a very interesting story. And this woman was seemed like a professional journalist. She wasn't just some gossiper on the Daily, Ma on the Daily Mail. You know, she was solid. And she said, okay, Miles, we've got to offer you £15,000, about $18,000. Sorry. Uh, Western food, still getting used to it. And... I was like, yeah, 15 grand, solid. Why not, you know? So, uh, I'll meet you at the airport. So we, we enter London through the VIP lounge because they, they want, actually want to avoid the press the other people do. And I say, hey, I've got one press waiting here. So I'll go to her privately. So I go to her and I go, oh, pleasure to meet you in person. You know, we've been talking. She seems lovely. You know, I'll, I'll sit on 15 grand. I've sent over documents, but you haven't signed it. You know, what's up with that? And she goes, ah, geez, Miles. Ah, geez, we, we're having some trouble. We, you know, I, we said fifteen grand, but now we we can't exactly do that. It's out of my hands. If I would, I would give you fifteen grand. I'll give you a million grand because you're my friend. I'm just there, like, mm -hmm, mm -hmm, come on. And she goes one thousand, and I'm like, fuck off, hell no. I'm very polite about it. I go, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. very sorry, but I have to go. Thank you very much for your time. Let's walk out. And then she goes, oh wait, wait, no, we got some, we got some press, uh, we got some people with cameras on the other side of the airport looking for you. Uh, do you mind if you take some certain photos? I'm like, yeah, absolutely, take some photos. She's like, really? I'm like, yeah, pay me fifteen grand. And the other journalist who wrote some trash about me, and I mean like not opinion articles, like I don't like Lord Masks X Y Z. Have your opinions, fair enough. But these people were just writing straight up lies. Like I spoke to them, I audio recorded their conversations too. I never said half the things they said. They they maybe inferred it. it they couldn't have. Uh, miss, I'm very clear of my words when I speak to the press just because they, they pull some BS out of their ass. And they would just make up lies, straight up. And sometimes they would say they've got exclusive with me when they've never spoken to me before. And I think, you know, that's that's insane. You know, I've got lawsuits coming here. So I tweeted out, no, sorry, I sent messages out to some journalists going, hey, I'm arriving at Birmingham Airport this time. I really, I was in London. So I said, but we're arriving at Birmingham Airport this time. I might be uh, debriefed by MI6, so please wait for me for a few hours. You can take as many photos as you want. I sent that all to all the scummy journalists, and about, I think about six or seven of them turned up. And they were waiting there for like five or six hours, and they were messaging me like, hey, where are you? I was like, ah, geez, man, really getting debriefed, you know? And then, then they were like, Miles, you're not here, are you? Because they see a photo of me at Gatwick or something. And I said, yeah, you shouldn't lie about me in the press. Bloody hell, consider this a lesson. You know, I was like, I'm the control journalist. At this point, it's just fun to harass journalists because they've been harassing me for two years. At this point, I just see it as a game. What's the, where does the name Lord come from? Oh, yeah, uh, identity fraud. Um, so a bunch of my flatmates I was sharing a house with uh, in the first year of uni, I told them the homeless story and they thought it was hilarious. They were like, hey, you were homeless. And they were like, at the time I had loads of, I like e-boy hair, very nice cut. So they thought I was curious how they were like, man, if you were homeless, you got bummed by some homeless dude. And it became like a running joke. We all had digs each other. And at one point they said, um, he said, all right, mate, uh, we're going to get you a gift for you for uh, Christmas, you know, a little gag gift. Cause we know, we know you're spending Christmas at uni and we're not going to be around. So we thought we would, uh, Give you some gifts. Oh, shocks, man. Thank you. And I opened it up. It was a lordship certificate. You know, one of us buy a metre plus of land in Scotland thing. But this was in, what, 2018, 2019, before it blew up, before it became known as a, like, a, not a scam, but like, you know, just obviously a gag gift. And it was a gag gift. They were like, oh, you're homeless, but you are lords, so a homeless lord. <laughs> Isn't that just funny? It was, I don't know. We were kids. And I looked at it. I thought, wait a minute. This has like, you know, this has like, this is very high end. This is a lovely certificate. It actually looks genuine. 
what does a lordship certificate look like? I Google it. There's no, there's no standard. There's no thing. And I think that's prime for exploit right there. I'm going to take this joke one step further. So I put on my only suit of a time, my best suit. And I walk into the bank and I walk in just before lunchtime. This is like a catch me if you can type of thing. So I do it just before lunch. So obviously they want to get off very quickly and they're just pushing through the last few customers. And I put on an accent and I go, oh, excuse me, yes, hello, hello. And they go, oh, hello there, what can, you, what can we do for you? And I go, oh, I want to change my title. My father bought some land and um, I've really moved up the world. I'm rather quite glad about it. But uh, uh, I've got this lordship certificate over here. I'm wondering if you, could, uh, if you could rectify my account. Thank you very much. I'm doing it with all my other bank accounts. So it's, very, it's a big problem offshore with my father, you know, running the business. And so obviously I invented a father, I invented a business, I'm inventing that I have money offshore. I really have one bank account at the time with a few grand in it. And so obviously psychologically, they're like, okay, this guy's got the suit, he's got the accent, he's, he's dressed well, you know, he's presenting himself well, he's in third way, he's got a big business. They look for a certificate and they go, it's shiny, <laughs> why not? Photocopy it, uh, request on the system from Mr. to Lord. And it gets printed on my credit file, gets get put on every piece of official document apart from my passport because you don't get titles on your passport. And then I go to my friends, I go, eh. And it's not just it's not to scam people, it's not to suddenly present myself as a lord, it's just I thought it was funny. It was just like, can I pull strings, you know what I mean? Can I uh can I see the cracks in the system and have fun with it? And you know, you know, you know, it's like it's a bit harmless, but you can see what path I'm going down at that point. Even then I'm showing red flags of you know, pulling strings, catch me if you can, exploiting systems, you know, yeah. I see you've done an interview with Tay, so shout out to Tay, everybody knows Shout that. out to Tay, top G, and I, I spent eight months with the top T's, top Taliban. Mm -hmm. How was uh, Tay? Oh, he was solid, honestly. I've heard about the controversy where he, you know, got imprisoned when I was in prison myself, so I, I heard news for the grapevine. And I, I've met him a few times beforehand. I even knew him before he was famous. And he's a solid bloke, honestly. I've seen the stuff he's done. Um, I've been to his house. And there's no women chained up and begging for their lives. I mean, he's publicly said that he's done cam girl stuff. And as a Christian, I don't agree with that. But he's a solid bloke. I do not agree. I do not think he's trafficked people. I've looked at all the evidence objectively. And I've said, you know what? It's, it's very weak and circumstantial at best. There is no case. And it's why he's not in prison. Despite, obviously, him being very unpopular with some governments. And he told me some exclusive information that's not public. And he showed me the evidence for it. And it looks like the rabbit hole goes a little bit deep. It looks like people want him off you know, the internet. And I think you're, you're mates of him too, aren't you? So yeah. you know what I mean when I say that. You know, there's some powerful people. He's gone too big. No, he's far yeah, too big. The whole big. Matrix thing is, is true. If, if, if a billionaire has a problem with you, he can destroy you. Now imagine if government has a problem with you. You're fucked. Exactly, yeah. Yeah. What's the plans for the future? Oh, well, I'm just glad I have a future at this point, man. <laughs> but uh, after this, plan for a future. We're going to get some drinks. It's what was it, nine in the morning? Yeah. I don't drink, man, but I think I might start. <laughs> <laughs> it's, like, it's like, wow, why is my family uh, full of alcoholics? Wow. It's like you drink, you feel great. Amazing. Hmm. Kidding. Nah, I'm not going to do that. Maybe, maybe one. Uh, that's how it starts, right? <laughs> but after this, I'm going back to Afghanistan. If, in like I said to the Taliban commander, uh, I said three weeks, so it's been about a week and about two weeks, very roughly, going back to Afghanistan. He's given me a letter that says, okay, Miles, you are honorary Mujahideen. You cannot be stopped, stopped a military checkpoint. You cannot be searched. You cannot be arrested unless if it's a very serious crime, like murder or something. Uh, and anyone who holds you beyond checking the validity of this document will be arrested themselves and potentially executed. So it was like a very serious document saying, you are a guy you can't be messed with. And I'm very happy about that because I do want to open the gold mine in Afghanistan. It is happening. I'm meeting with kind of some private equity hedge fund type people, you know, very powerful bankers. that are just like me, you know, very autistic, very goofy. They're meeting me in London on Monday for some drinks. I'm, meet, I'm having big things. So the plan is if I open a gold mine, it's not to get fancy Lamborghinis and a big house. It's literally just to fund bigger adventures. You see what I mean? It's, it's, uh, it's a cycle. But if I do that, I am... Um, I am loaded for life, 100%. There's $200 million of gold there. Where's the most dangerous place in the world? Birmingham, mate. 100%. <laughs> I've, I've had knives fresh on me in Birmingham. I, I, okay, no joke. Third time I came back from Afghanistan, I went through Birmingham airport, 3 a.m. So I, I come out and it's, it, I write about it in my new book and it's very, very quiet. 
And I go sit uh, in Mackey's and then it gets about 5 a.m. So I go, okay, but uh, the uh, train station's going to be open soon. The train station's a popular tourist attraction in Birmingham because it's where you get to leave. So a lot of people love that place. Mm -hmm. um, so I go there and I'm sitting on a bench and there's no one around me. Homeless guy walks up to me. I go, oh, yeah, I'll give it some change. And he sits down and he goes, you know what? If if I Here's a question for you. I'm a philosopher. I'm like, oh, here we go. And he goes, if I rape a woman and forced to have my child, like keep her in my basement or something, I forced to have my child, am I God because I'm creating life? And I'm like, holy crap. I was like, all right, mate. I'm like, this is Birmingham. Yeah, I, I'm not. So I talked to me, just talked nonsense about that. I can talk about that guy for an hour. Holy crap. But he goes on that rant. And that's my first impression again after coming back to Birmingham. And I'm like, it's not a safe place, maybe. You, this does not happen in Afghanistan. This doesn't happen in some nice parts of London. Does it happen in Glasgow? Yeah, there's fucking fruit cakes here. Yeah, there. yeah, fair enough. Yeah, yeah. yeah. this is this is uh, Glasgow, is, I guess, uh, Scottish Birmingham. So uh, honestly, I would say Birmingham's dangerous, man. I've, I'm afraid of a knife so many times. I'm about to run from some dodgy people. I think the whole UK is kind of similar though now. There's a lot of yeah, good man. people, man. There's a lot of great things. I love Glasgow, I'm a Scotsman, but there is a lot of mad yeah. bastards. What about? Callum abroad, we need to give Callum a shout oh, out, yeah, man. Check out Callum's content, a great hey, guy. Man. Shout out to Callum 100%. Hey, if, if you if you do anything after this, guys, search Callum abroad on YouTube. This solid guy. I was stuck in uh, what's Carlisle. it? Carlisle. Yeah, Carlisle and also uh, some other places. Turns out some guy killed himself on the train tracks and there was a huge flood because of the rain yesterday and uh, some trees fell on the line or whatever. So Callum drove two hours on a whim all the way to Carlisle from Glasgow for me. And I've never met this bloke before. We've talked a little bit, but he's solid. And he drove me all the way back so we can make this whole thing. He's a solid bloke. I spoke to him for two hours in the, tr in the car. We're meeting after this as well. Lovely guy. Lovely guy. Solid. I love him. Go follow him. And thank you very much, Callum, by the way. I do owe you one, to put it lightly. And I owe you a lot more, to put it lightly. Yeah, he's doing some great stuff. He's speaking with the Taliban. He's traveling oh, all yeah, over the world, yeah. going to some dangerous well, places. So check together. out Callum's uh, Instagram, his YouTube, his Twitter, and give him a follow, guys. He's solid. Brother, listen, you're a thank mad you. master, man. I'll you're clearly you. loving it. But would you like to finish up on anything yeah, else? Man. Well, I'm going to Tora Bora the Taliban invited me there so that's where Bin Laden headed out I'm going to be the first person to go to the Chinese Afghan border no one's been there since 1947 only one black and white photo exists I've got that planned I'm going to a, a secret military base in above the Arctic Circle the Canadian government said no but it's not exactly a fence I'm going to travel through 500 miles of the Arctic I've been to Snake Island but I'm going again I'm going through the Darien Gap if you google that guys that's a fun one there's literally schools on spikes and 20% of people who enter this 80 miles of hellish jungle do not make it do not make it out they just die I've uh, got cartel contacts in Mexico um, I'm pulling strings in every country I can there is nowhere I'm not going, and I think Callum's going to join me too. And I think I'm going to be back with you at some point to tell some yeah, stories. Time, brother. And I'll bring you some. Uh, I'll bring you some like uh, material, some gifts from these countries. Definitely, yeah, definitely. What about your social media links? Your oh, YouTube, yeah, I mean, Twitter, YouTube, Instagram. Twitter. Hey guys, if you search Lord Miles, it's Miles spent with an I. If you search that on Twitter, I've got 210k followers, so I've kind of boomed up recently. On Instagram, it's Real Lord Miles. Uh, so if you search that up too, the link is on my Twitter. Uh, so my my Instagram is a little bit smaller, but it's starting to grow. So please go and follow, guys. You will not want to miss out the stuff I'm doing. I do not spam your I do not spam your uh, feed. I do some amazing stuff. You will have fun. Plus my YouTube is just Lord Miles as well. I'm going to be uploading some old Vice style documentaries, some very professionally made stuff. I'm talking to producers at the moment for like limited Netflix series and stuff. So I'm really moving up. So get in early. You'll love the videos. I do one when I go shooting with the Taliban. It's got millions of views for a reason. Please go and check it out, guys. And plus DM me. I, I try and respond to everyone I can. And I would love to meet some of you. So please DM me. You will not want to miss out. Come follow. Carl, that's Good an man. absolute pleasure. But I look forward to see what you do for the future. And I look forward to seeing you back on the Thank podcast. Thank you, man. It'll be good to be back. Yeah. Take care, bro. Thank you, guys.